that NHS Highland has agreed that services should be uh, resumed locally and as quickly as possible. Thank you, Minister. That concludes question time and brings us to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12491 in the name of Willie Rennie on privacy and the state. must advise the Chamber that we are very tight for time across all debates this afternoon. Can I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move the motion with a maximum of 10 minutes to do so. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Liberals in all political parties, and none, have a healthy suspicion of government's voracious appetite for information on us and on every individual. Information is a powerful tool, and used in the right way can help us. But if misused, can be intrusive and sometimes even dangerous. The purpose of today is to allow this Parliament to openly debate the complex issues that surround this important matter. It is our hope that this will not be the only time, the only debate for this important topic in this chamber, and that all members of this parliament will have future opportunities to consider primary legislation to ensure effective scrutiny of any changes. Unfortunately, it is the government's current intention to restrict debate to one committee. So all this motion seeks is that simple aim. That is to put the changes into primary legislation. It is not to determine whether any changes would be acceptable or otherwise, whether they amount to an identity card system or not. I only seek support for primary legislation if these proposals are to advance. Now, let me explain why this should be the case. The first reason is scale. The proposal has the potential to cover 120 organisations across the public sector. This matters because the current diffuse storage of information has an inbuilt protection from crime and misuse that would be lost if one super database shared across the public sector. We know the problem with putting all your eggs in the one basket, of putting all your savings into one bank or business. We should be cautious when the government asks us to do the same now. The second reason is the unique citizen reference number, the persistent identifier, as it is often called. Yes, we do have a unique number at present, but it is not unique across the public sector. To allow all organisations to share that number means we move from having a series of numbers to one single universal number. It leaves open the possibility that information can be searched, profiled and mined. The Scottish Government's own principles for identity management, just published by John Swinney last October, states in section 4.6, if a public service organisation needs to link personal information from different systems and databases, internally or between organisations, it should avoid sharing persistent identifiers. So these proposals today seem to breach John Swinney's own principles. Moving on to the third reason. The current system operates on an opt-in basis, whereas this new approach means that everyone's address will be automatically included through the transfer of the Community Health Index postcode into the NHS Central Registry. So there will be no consent required for your full details to appear on this universal database. By virtue of simply being born, your details could be accessible by Quality Meat Scotland or even the Botanic Gardens. We would not be in control of our own information. Now, I have set out three reasons why these plans are flawed. Scale, unique number and consent. There are others but these should be sufficient to cause at least some doubt in the minds of SNP members today. Yes. I am pleased that the Conservatives, Labour and the Greens agree with our concerns, and I would be interested in the opinions <coughs> of the independent members. But for those who are considering backing the Government's amendment, I would urge them to reflect carefully. If there is even a scintilla of doubt in their mind, about what the government is proposing, they should vote for our motion. To vote with the government is giving them permission 
to proceed with limited, inadequate scrutiny. The Scottish Government disputes the claim made that this is a precursor to an ID card. The problem is this. If there is an all-encompassing single database with one single number for each individual with no consent required, then it is a simple process to produce a card with that number on it, stick a picture on it, and you've got an ID card. I think everyone would recognise that as an ID card, not just now. We may not be there yet, but we are creeping towards that destination. If SNP members have any doubt, they should vote with us today. I am grateful to the Open Rights Group, to the No to ID campaign for their advice and support they have provided to inform this debate. They have very real concerns. The British Medical Association have expressed concern about the relationship between the NHS database and tax collection, yep. fearing that it may drive patients away. The Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations wants the government to think again. But it was the submission from the UK's Information Commissioner's Office that caused greatest alarm. He spoke of breaching European and British data protection laws, creeping towards an ID card system and the lack of reason and necessity with the government's plans. So members don't have to take my word for it. Listen to the other voices, ignoring the advice of the independent information commissioner would be unwise for any member of any parliament. Now, very few are against, ID, are against cards that identify us. We need forms of identification to conduct our daily business. Our parliamentary card is an ID card. My driving licence, my bank card, my Carnegie Harriers membership card, <laughs> probably the most important of all. They are all forms of identification and information. But each one has a different number and each is stored on different databases. So it is not identification I oppose, it is the super ID database that concerns me. Yes. Patrick Harvey. Um, Order, please. Sorry, colleagues. Uh, I'm grateful to, to Willie Rennie for getting away. Does he agree with me that those who raised concerns about the UK identity card scheme, including members on the SNP benches and some of the organisations who have engaged their concerns on this issue, did not raise that principally about the piece of plastic. It, it, was, it was about the data system behind it and the ways at which it could be used. That's the point of similarity and the issue that we should be putting uh, on the agenda today. Well, Rennie. No, Patrick Harvey is absolutely right. Um, it is about the whole system. It's not just about the bit of plastic. It's about the database behind it, because that's open to potential theft and misuse. So Patrick Harvey is right on the button. He is right to identify the whole system, not just the card. And I'll take an intervention. Christian Allard. Thank you. I thank very much the members for taking an intervention. He talked about, at the start of, his, of, his, of the debate, he talked that it was not a debate about ID cards. And now we're only here talking about ID cards. I've got one here. ID cards will not be imposed by any Scottish government until the SNP will stay, will, will, will stay in power. We can't say the same thing about Westminster. So is this Can debate about ID on, cards please? or not? Well, it any. That's all I need is Christian Allard's assurance. That gives me the greatest confidence I could ever need to make sure that I drop this motion today. The reality is he has more confidence in this than I do. The reality is he is, and his government, is preparing a super ID database. It's one step towards card. Now, now, members obviously don't agree with that, but if they have any doubt, and if they have any doubt, they should be listening to the protest Order, please. Groups. They should be listening to the privacy groups. They should be listening to the BMA, the SCVO, because they have doubts. Are their opinions no longer to count anymore? If they have doubt, they should be considering their position today. I accept the government needs methods to authenticate that a person is who she Dr. says she is. It prevents fraud and ensures people get what they are entitled to. But all we need to do is to look south of the border to the Cabinet Office, to the system that has been identified for an identification system, working together with privacy groups to create a system to, do, to 
Order, please. The members in his last to 30 seconds, we must hear him. To work together with privacy groups to make sure we have a system that is diffuse, that does not involve one single database, that makes sure I, our information is protected. For once, the Scottish Government should look to others for their advice and their support. So my message today is simple. If members support the Government's amendment, they are voting to limit the scrutiny these proposals will receive. If members have doubts, they should express them by voting and supporting for my motion. Members do not have to agree with everything I have said. They may reject some of the arguments made by privacy campaigners. They may not even accept all the points made by the Information Commissioner. You must but conclude. if members have any doubts, they should vote for our motion today. Thank you very much. I now call on John Swinney to speak to and move Amendment 1249.1. Deputy First Minister, a strict seven minutes, please. Presiding officer, at the outset, I'd like to make two points clear on behalf of the Scottish Government. Firstly, I would like to reiterate this Government's unequivocal commitment to the protection of privacy. This Government took the initiative in 2009 to set up an expert group to develop identity management and privacy principles. This group included privacy expertise and interests from outside the public sector. Principles were established in 2010 and updated in 2014, and they guide the policies of the Scottish Government. I am determined that we continue to lead good practice and act in a manner consistent with these principles. Secondly, I would like to make clear that the Government will consider carefully all of the representations made during the recent consultation, and I confirm that no decisions have been taken on any of these issues. I can also confirm today that privacy impact assessments will be a necessary prerequisite of any proposals that are advanced, and must satisfactorily address the issues that have been raised in the consultation process. Decisions will also only be taken after there has been full parliamentary scrutiny of any proposals that we advance. In trying to give a proper assessment of the changes that we propose and to determine if they should be pursued, it is important, important to consider the purpose of these changes. Our first purpose is that in delivering public services, the service provider must know that they are dealing with the right person, recognising the growing expectations of the public that they will be able to access public services online. The service user must also be sure that he or she is not being mistaken for anyone else. The consequences of not authenticating identity appropriately can be significant for individuals who could receive the wrong or no service at all. These checks will help prevent fraud and identity theft and are intended to give confidence to those, those using public services online. Our second purpose is to help identify those taxpayers that should properly be defined as Scottish taxpayers for the purposes of the Scottish rate of income tax. This is critical because it will help to crack down on tax avoidance and evasion and ensure that the correct amount of tax flows to the Scottish budget to support our public services. These are our purposes in holding this consultation. The question... Uh, of course. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the Deputy First Minister. I, I was grateful to him yesterday in meeting uh, alongside me with some of the campaign groups, such as Open Rights Group, who are concerned about these matters. They, does he acknowledge that they did not seek to uh, ignore or to uh, circumvent these purposes? They understand these purposes. Their argument is that there is a better way of achieving them, one which does not give rise to the same concerns around data security and privacy. Deputy First Minister. Well, I'll come on to say a little bit about that in the course of my remarks. There are, these are our purposes then, Presiding Officer, in holding this consultation. The question now becomes how it is, how it is that we achieve these two objectives. Our consultation paper sets out that the most secure, accurate, privacy and user-friendly way to do this is by strictly controlled use of the National Health Service Central Register. I believe this is, approach is preferable to contracting with private sector bodies to use a combination of their databases and public sector databases, and it's preferable to creating a new database. Because one thing we are not doing, we are not, under any circumstances, creating a new database. The register has existed since the 1950s, and legislation strictly regulates its use, which is further protected by agreements which the Registrar-General for Scotland puts in place. The register contains core facts about individuals born in Scotland, drawn from birth records, and who have a registered GP. But let me stress this point. Despite the title of the register, the register does not, does not hold health records. 
The only health information recorded is whether a person has been treated for cancer, and this is only released for research purposes under strict anonymised controls. Another important point to make is that using the NHS register, if these proposals proceed, will not be a novel departure. In 2006, this Parliament passed primary legislation, the Local Electoral Administration and Registration Services Scotland Act 2006. The Lears Act put the National Health Service Central Register on a statutory footing, provided for a reference number, now referred to as the UCRN, to be contained on the register, and provided powers for the sharing of information. It also provided for secondary legislation to extend who could have access to information from the register. This legislation was put on the statute book by a Liberal Democrat Minister, George Lyon. For the, last, for, the last nine years, for the last nine years, where an individual has sought a concessionary travel card, this approach has been used to check against the register to verify that individual's identity. This has occurred under strict controls. That system has worked well. And what we now propose is that other organisations, central government bodies who will provide online services, should be able also to check, and I stress, check specified data. Willie Rennie indicated that he accepted the need for governments to undertake authentication work. That is precisely what is proposed in this consultation exercise. Uh, of course. Willie Rennie. D does he not recognise and does he not agree that in fact he's now going beyond what the original legislation was proposing? In essence, by introducing the chip, the CHI postcode into this NHS central registry is going from an opt-in to a compulsory system. Yeah. Does he not recognise that? John Swinney. No, I don't recognise that because this is about people trying to access online public services, opting to have their identity verified to protect their identity from identity fraud. Now, the final question I want to explore in this debate is why we should consider this approach. Having read a number of the responses to the consultation and having met yesterday with the Open Rights Group, I am very aware of the concerns that have been raised. As we address these, there are additional important points that I believe Parliament must also consider. Next year, we will have the Scottish Rate of Income Tax introduced, but we also have the plan for the full implementation of the Smith Commission proposals. Our block grant will be reduced next year as a result of introducing the Scottish Rate of Income Tax by approximately £5 billion and we will be responsible for raising an equivalent amount in revenue. It is vital that we get implementation of the new income tax powers right. Following the transition period, for every 1% error, for every 1% of the Scottish taxpayer base that we cannot identify, that could cost this Parliament's budget potentially £50 million or more. That is £50 million for public services, for schools, for hospitals, for police. Now, the responsibility for implementing and operating the Scottish rate of income tax lies with HMRC and the UK Government, and they have asked us you to consider conclude, the please. issues that are raised in this consultation, and in the interest of good government, I am doing exactly that. Now, what I pledge to Parliament today is that I will work cooperatively across the political spectrum to ensure that agreement is reached. We will subject any proposals we bring forward to wide consultation and to the full parliamentary scrutiny that was provided for us in the Lears Act in 2006, put in place by the Liberal Democrats. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Dr Richard Simpson to speak to and move Amendment 12491.1, maximum five minutes, Dr Simpson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by drawing members' attention to my declarations of interest in respect to the membership of some organisations who I refer to in my speech? Scottish Labour from the outset wants to say that it fully understands the intention and purposes of the government's proposals and it also fully concurs with the need to establish a Scottish tax database in order to ensure that the tax can be fully collected in Scotland for Scotland. So we accept that point. However, we believe in the first instance that these issues really should have been debated in a full debate in the Parliament at a much earlier stage. Because it is certainly true that some see this as the first step in establishing a national ID system. It is this single system that is a, is a matter of concern. Indeed, our central concern, however, is that the registration data given by patients as part of a freely entered into compact with the NHS is to be used for other purposes for which that consent was never given. Now, before elaborating, I want to, get to review some history. Some of this data has indeed, as the Minister, Deputy Minister has said, 
been used for other purposes, verification of a benefit application. But of course, that's a positive request for application in which, of course, authentication is important. But the issue of the relationship between the privacy of the individual and the needs of the state are a very current issue. In an increasingly electronic age, our citizens' privacy is daily more undermined. Too often, information about us is obtained or used without our full knowledge and appreciation. The most extreme aspect of this was represented, I think, in the Citizen 4 documentary, which made clear about GCHQ undertaking widespread surveillance of all our digital communications. It is the first action of a centralising state to capture as much information as it can about its citizens. The issue of privacy was subject of a review in 2009, which I would recommend to members, called the Database State. This was sponsored by Joseph Rowntree Foundation and led by Professor Ross Anderson from Cambridge, whom I would request the government to consult on this issue. He is a world leader on privacy issues. This report assessed the 46 existing databases across major government departments and found that a quarter of all existing public sector databases reviewed were almost certainly illegal under human rights or data protection law. More than half have significant problems with privacy or effectiveness and could indeed fall, fall foul of a legal challenge. Britain is currently out of line with other developed countries where records and sensitive matters like healthcare and social care services are held locally. In Britain, data is increasingly centralised and shared between health and social services, police, schools, local government and even the, now the tax man. The benefits claimed for data sharing are often illusory Sharing can harm the vulnerable, not least by leading to discrimination and stigmatisation. Now, turning to this particular proposal, at first it looks innocuous. However, the BMA and the Royal College of GPs believe that while consensual registration of postcode and address to the NHS number is appropriate and will enhance health data nationally, the access of this and the Community Health Index by a tax authority is inappropriate and access by many of the other 120 agencies is, to say the least, surprising. As, as Willie Rennie said, quality meet, architect and design, visit Scotland. I certainly don't want them to have my, my information, although I understand from what uh, John Swinney said what he sees as the purpose of this. This measure... Yes. John Swinney. I, I, I just would like to just check Dr Simpson on a point that he just made there. The, the, the organisations that are listed would not have access to the data. They would be able to, check, to clarify and verify with the Registrar General the, the identity of individuals to ensure they were able to access public services. And so they wouldn't have access to that information. Dr Simpson, you're approaching your last minute. I, I, I do not want it to be, to be misunderstood here. I am not suggesting they would have access to my NHS data. I accept that point fully. But if you give permission for your authentication details to be given for one purpose, without consenting for it to be used for another purpose, I do not believe that to be appropriate. Now, the, uh, Willie Rennie also mentioned Ken MacDonald, who has, called, uh, has said that the proposals could be in breach of the European rules, which is a very serious statement for the Information Commissioner to make. He has called for a privacy impact assessment, and I welcome uh, uh, John Swinney's agreement that that will indeed be carried out. But he has said that the use of a national identifying number for whatever positive apparent purpose uh, has to be firstly subject to a, second, uh, a proper debate and secondly he has uh, cautioned and I quote against the creeping use of such unique uh, identifiers. This should not just happen by default and the BMA certainly feel that it would undermine patient confidence and the relationship with the health service. Now if the NHS electronic data were totally secure and private, and I accept the point that this is not what people will apparently have access to, but they will have access to the CHI number, and the CHI number is increasingly used in relation to access to NHS data. I'm afraid you're and over I, time. I, I took one intervention. Can I have just two seconds? I've got one paragraph, and this is really important. The, the, there were 794 breaches in Lothian over a two-year period of electronic data inappropriate access. The NHS system is currently not fit for purpose. It doesn't meet the European requirements under the I versus Finland Act. And therefore, we have a situation where by using your unique identifier, people can maliciously get access to NHS data. Linking one identifier with another Dr. is Simpson. extremely dangerous and needs a full debate. Thank you. Can I explain to the Chamber that if members go over time, then it will have to come out of backbench or closing speeches? I can't magic up time. 
I call in Liz Smith, please. Five minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank Willie Rennie for bringing this uh, to Parliament. Uh, indeed, I think it's a wider debate uh, about the role of the state and how far its power should extend. Because I think if you look back uh, through history, uh, it doesn't matter uh, which age, uh, whether it was the ancient Greeks or the disputes between people like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke in British uh, philosophical history, uh, or whether it was people trying to rebuild our democratic traditions after two world wars, this is an important issue. And I think it is as relevant today uh, because of the uh, comments that Willie Rennie uh, has made. And they relate to the possible changes in the National Health Service Central Register. And it is a serious one, and he's quite right to say that it deserves the very full attention of the whole Parliament. Indeed, given the very strong concerns, which he has acknowledged uh, himself, uh, that have been expressed by the Information Commissioner, the British Medical Association and the Scottish Council uh, for Voluntary Organisations. I don't really think any political party in this chamber could possibly argue otherwise uh, and that's why the Scottish Conservatives will support uh, the motion to have this properly debated in Parliament and also the Labour Amendment. And let's be very clear, there are uh, some understandable aims uh, behind this to improve the uh, quality of data, which is obviously an increasing part of our lives, as Richard Simpson rightly said, to help trace uh, missing persons or vulnerable children and to facilitate online access of data to name but three. But it's what goes beyond this uh, which has become so controversial and which was uh, so ably uh, set out by Willie Rennie. The Open Rights Group has made it very clear that it believes that this unique citizen reference number is not actually a randomised number, as the Scottish Government has claimed, and that proposals to expand the right of identification of data up to 120 uh, public bodies instead of uh, the current constraint when it limits it to the NHS and local authorities would, in effect, be one step closer. It doesn't necessarily mean it is an ID card, but it is one step closer to that. And in particular, I think it is the diminished role of consent of the individual which disturbs us most. John Swinney claimed this morning, and he said again in his speech this afternoon, that there is a guarantee of privacy. And he was very sincere about that. And I uh, can accept that in principle, he, he really genuinely believes that. But I think regarding the actual practice of this, I don't think people are fully concerned for exactly the reasons that Patrick Harvey uh, said in his intervention. Because as soon as the action of the state uh, is directed too much in favour of compulsion and the laws are backed by a lack of public consent, then I think the exercise of personal and social and moral freedom is necessarily inhibited. And that's something that should worry us all. And it is exactly uh, the reason uh, why the Westminster government, after a very long and controversial debate, decided not to introduce ID cards. Indeed, I have the transcripts of debates in this parliament from 2005 when national ID cards were being considered and those from the House of Commons and House of Lords debate at the same time uh, and why they were eventually uh, rejected. So I think we need to be extremely careful uh, about uh, not doing something uh, that would involve a, a backdoor movement towards ID in Scotland. And I think the... Um, Trends within Western democracies, which have obviously been towards a more uh, liberal uh, attitude in, in social policy, I, I think the philosophical tensions about where the state lies, and that has, has grown stronger, and I think that is a contradiction within uh, the SNP's current uh, policy outlook, because they're very quick to tell us that they wholeheartedly espouse a liberal uh, democratic tradition, uh, and that they will do much more to increase our personal freedoms, and to promote greater equality and social justice. Yet I think over the course of the majority government since uh, 2011, I think the SNP has been uh, bordering on becoming much more paternalistic and much more orientated towards the role of the state. And so that's another reason why I feel uh, that we have... Well, this, co this comes on the back of legislation about named persons. It comes on the back of a whole lot of things. It's, it's the same thing. It is absolutely the same thing. And it's a, it's a prime example of pushing the boundaries of state too far. And I think it's symptomatic, it's sympt it's symptomatic of a government that has become, uh, I think, uh, overly intrusive in the lives of people in Scotland. And that's yet another reason why I think this has to be looked at extremely carefully. So we are in, very much in full support of what Willie Rennie uh, has proposed in his motion. It must be, it must be debated uh, with the full scrutiny of Parliament behind, and we're very happy to accept the Labour amendment. Thank you.
Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. As I already indicated when this debate started, we are very tight for time. Speeches of a maximum of four minutes and interventions must be within your own time. Members know that I am not in the habit of cutting off microphones, but I am afraid this afternoon I may have to. Christine Graham to be followed by Drew Smith. Yeah, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I think this should be a very thoughtful debate and not really party political, which I am afraid I think the last contribution was drifting into that area. Because I am asking myself, is the data necessary? What is its purpose? Is it sufficiently limited? Is it secure? And will it command public support? Now, first of all, I welcome very much that this is a consultation. The consultation has just closed. I understand why the Liberal Democrats have brought the debate, but I think this is early doors. There's some way to go. And I notice the government hasn't got its view set in stone, and I was a wee bit surprised to find it was so many organisations, some 120, that might have access, but I, I'm expecting that may evolve. I understand, and this is new territory, because I know many of the public understand there was an NHS service central register. But many of the public knew about it. Uh, and I didn't know that the National Register... Let me just make some progress. The National Registers of Scotland were, in fact, the public body that maintained and owned it. But only about 30% of the population currently on that. And I do note, and this is significant in the debate, it doesn't actually hold anybody's records it holds their address and name and date of birth so that records can be properly moved about. It doesn't actually hold them itself. That's significant. Now, I think we all accept that we require a robust, fair and, um, not volatile, that's the word I'm looking for, one that can be registered, that can be brought up to date, a database for the purpose of gathering income tax in Scotland. We accept that. So data is necessary. Are we seeking the right source? Well, that might be open to argument. But let's look at this. At the moment, local authorities and health boards use the, NA, the NHS central register, but that currently is subject to individual agreement, so it's, it's not complete. But every one of us, as somebody has referred to, has a CHAI number. A lot of people don't know they've got that either. Got a CHAI number. So, well, let me just finish that sentence. So, uh, although everyone's not aware of it, we do have something that gives you a link to the individual within Scotland. And I'll let you come in, yes. John Finney. Uh, uh, that intervention. That's the second occasion you've mentioned low levels of public awareness. There is also the question of public perception. Would you agree that that can best be addressed by having the fullest debate further down the road as per the Lib Dem motion? Christine Graham. Well, I, I, I don't think it's news to anybody in here that the public don't know they've got a chai number, didn't know about the central register. This is a fact of life. They don't know that Tesco, when you go online, can say, Christine, do you want your favourite groceries? And comes up with everything you get every week. There's people holding data on us all over the place that we are frankly unaware of. But my understanding of the crux of this is that it's the centralisation of the information that's currently held by Health Board that's the key to it. And one of the other issues about it is that this is the security of the holding of that information. And I think these are, uh, certainly in the security of it, that's a reasonable argument to put. Centralisation, I don't have such a problem with it. You know, when I got a letter from HMRC some years ago telling me that my tax was to go up because I was getting a state pension, I didn't, hadn't even got it, I hadn't even applied for it, but the DWP had been in touch with HMRC. So lots of other government agencies know what you're up to. You don't need to know now whether to tell the, the, um, the, the DVLA whether or not you've got insurance. They'll tell you because they're in touch with their insurers. So all this interlocking stuff's already happening. It's whether it's necessary and whether it's secure and whether in an internet age it enables people, individuals, but also the state or the government to function properly. Must because close. privacy is not absolute. There's a duty on a citizen to meet their tax obligations and they will be required to surrender some privacy, as we already do for income tax and national insurance sorry, and everything else, off, to enable the state to function. Thank Many you. Many thanks. Drew Smith to be followed by Christian Allard. Uh, as always, I'm grateful to you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think uh, we all accept that there are a variety of reasons why government must hold certain data uh, about its citizens. And it does help us uh, administer pensions, benefits, the welfare system, and as Christine Graham says, uh, quite right, rightly, the tax system, which is, after all, our, our subscription to society. It can help keep uh, people safe, 
Um, uh, in the case of the NHS Central Register, it allows uh, uh, patient medical records to follow them as they move uh, around the country or perhaps in and out of the armed forces, uh, 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 or a whole variety of things. Um, and Willie Rennie was quite uh, uh, right to say uh, in beginning his contribution that there are plenty of valid reasons why government should keep important and necessary data. Um, and I think it's important to say that that's not being disputed um, today. Uh, and nor would I dispute uh, that data stored uh, uh, can and often is uh, put to a greater use. I think the, the Deputy First Minister mentioned uh, some of the medical research um, that flows uh, from uh, the Central Register, um, uh, and of course we would support that. But the key point is that all of this activity must be properly regulated to protect people's uh, privacy and indeed uh, their civil liberties. And to me, that comes down to I mean, there's a number of questions. We talk about who has access and why they have access. Uh, but I think the fundamental point raised uh, on this issue is how much data is held on a single database and how much sits on separate systems, because that is one of the fundamental um, protections. And the public must have confidence, in my view, in the laws and regulations which govern the use, storage uh, and sharing uh, of their data. And we need to know that public uh, consent to changes in the way their data uh, is used um, exists, because we need to satisfy ourselves that changes are fair and transparent, even if those changes are simply for checking and verification uh, purposes. And I have to say, the emails I've received from my constituents in the city of Glasgow certainly suggest that there are enough people out there uh, with very serious concerns about the changes which are being proposed uh, to warrant this issue being raised in Parliament. And I thank the Liberals uh, for bringing this debate today. But I mean, I think we'll all uh, experience the frustration uh, of, of the short speeches that uh, you'll rightly keep us to, President Officer. I think we do need to come back to this issue and have a much uh, uh, fuller debate. Um, what I hope we can uh, all agree on. Um, I think is that those concerns about privacy and liberty, whether or not uh, uh, the government agrees that those concerns are valid, valid or not, they must be fully addressed before we proceed any further with this. And I therefore support uh, the amendment in Dr Simpson's name. The Scottish Government, I think, have been keen to stress that the changes they propose are that, that limited in, in scope and they would be uh, for uh, specific purposes. Um, and one of those would be that the new arrangements would help the Scottish Government identify Scottish taxpayers. Uh, as the Parliament gains uh, a new raft of taxpayers. Well, I think we can understand that, but I think we do need to pay very serious attention when we have comments such as those from the British Medical uh, Association saying that they are deeply concerned about the use of central registered information to identify taxpayers, and they urge the government to consider an alternative uh, source of data. Um, Final minute. Uh, thank you, President Officer. It's the health profession itself, uh, which is warning the government not to use a health database to support tax collection because it could uh, deter people from registering with their GP and damage that relationship uh, of trust between uh, people and their doctors, uh, which is a relationship based on trust. Of course, also the, the comments others have highlighted from uh, Ken MacDonald, which I think are very serious and need to be um, uh, taken very seriously by the government, uh, if we're to prevent uh, a national identity database uh, emerging by default. And in closing, President Officer, um, I, I welcome the time that we've had to discuss this issue this afternoon, and I've certainly called and, and uh, supported my constituents when they've contacted me about um, this issue, but I, I do remain absolutely convinced that these are substantive changes, and they must be subject to not only a full debate in this place, but a broader national debate uh, in the country and the most rigorous, uh, rigorous possible uh, parliamentary scrutiny. And I think that is the message that I would certainly wish to convey to the government front bench uh, today and from to take from this debate. We need to come back and look at this close. issue uh, in greater detail. Thank you very much. Many President thanks. Officer. Christian Allard to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm delighted to participate in this debate. It's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to respond to Liberal Democrat members wanting to compare the action of this SNP government with the Westminster government. And I would be delighted to have a debate and make, make, maybe the Deputy First Minister will not be happy about it, but make it a political debate. Because I think there's a, a, a political views about it. At the end of the day, we are living now in a modern world with a, 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 a lot of uh, services available on the internet, and we want our public services to be available, to be available on the internet. And there are two ways of dealing with this modernization. You can either do, like the Westminster government, give everything to private companies to, to handle all this, or you can do like the SNP government and making sure that it stays in public hands and it's, it will be controlled, of course, by the public sector. Well, the, the member um, will recognise that Atos from France um, provides, supplies NHS CHI number services to the NHS in Scotland, along with a whole range of other private organisations.
So what's uh, the difference? Yes, uh, as, as soon as you say the word atos, I can't, I can't but accept to, to, to finish up. Atos was really a, a French company that your own government, our Westminster, used. And Atos thought it was so abysmal the that chair, they were please. asked to do that they had to renege the contract. They bought, they bought themselves out of the contract from, a, from, a, from, a, from the government. It's incredible that we'll use, you'll use Atos. <laughs> Let's talk about identity cards. I happen to have an identity card. I I'm still a French national. I'm the only one in this chamber to have an identity card. And believe you me, uh, presiding officer, let me tell Mr. Rene that I intend to stay the only one to have an identity card. This debate is not about identity card. The SNP, this SNP government will make sure there will be no identity card. Regarding the remark of Ken MacDonald, uh, uh, the Assistant Commissioner for Scotland and Northern Ireland, let's see what he wrote. He wrote that the data protection Protection Act 1998 requires that all data controllers must ensure that personal data shall be accurate and, when necessary, kept up to date. Although the NHS Central Register is the most authoritative record of individuals in Scotland, elements of the register are not complete. For example, address information is only held for around 30% of the population. By adding the Community Health Index postcode to the NHS Central Register and by matching and sharing both it and the unique property reference number, it is anticipated that the quality of the register and the records held will be improved. And that comes from the Commissioner, the Assistant Commissioner for Scotland and Northern Ireland. And Final it's, minute. it's really where the point is, uh, pre pre Presiding Officer. And we can again compare what's happening down south. And you'll see, for example, that companies like Royal Mail have been privatised under Liberal Democrat and Tory government. And this company, Royal Mail, uh, has UK contact and address data 29 million business and residential post postal address held by a privatized company. So really, we see a great contrast between uh, the Westminster government and this uh, Scottish government, this Scottish SNP government. And it's very, very important that we keep uh, the National Health Service as much uh, uh, protected by this globalization. And we heard, I'm not one of the MSP said that, but a lot of MSP came out and asked about foreign nationals who use our health service. This will help for national to pay for the health service, to make sure they pay their bills. And I'll take, I'll remind the Liberal Democrat that we might want to pay their bills like we have not paid the police Scotland You bill. must close, Our please. public services have to be protected and I will, uh, I you will must close, the rest please. of the chamber to, Thank you. To, Patrick to Harvey to be followed by Colin Keir. I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the chance to participate in this debate and I congratulate the, the Liberal Democrats for, for bringing it. I do agree with the basic argument that if a change of this nature is to be proposed, it should be subject to primary legislation and the full scrutiny that implies. And I also welcome Richard Simpson's uh, amendment today. I have to say I don't agree with every word that's been spoken in criticism uh, of the government's proposals here. Uh, there were elements, for example, of Liz Smith's speech, which she might not be surprised to, to learn. I didn't fully uh, endorse. But I think that in itself demonstrates the breadth of arguments, the breadth of different perspectives which are expressing similar concerns around this. There are those who take a, uh, who trying to draw a, a connection, rather tenuous one, I think, with things like the named person schemes, which I don't agree with. There are those who, uh, from a, a traditional liberal perspective, a different part of the political spectrum from my own. There are those who, whose anti-state agenda borders on paranoia sometimes. Uh, there are those uh, who are SNP members who have raised concerns uh, around these proposals as well. There are some on the Labour benches who may have voted against their own government's ID cards bill back in session two. There may be others who voted in favour, uncomfortably so, and there'll be others who've changed their position since. There's the Information Commissioner's Office. There's the Open Rights Group. There are some uh, who take this from a let's face it, a, a, a frankly technical and almost geekish point of view in the, the degree of their analysis. Such a broad range of different perspectives are leading many, many people to the same area of concerns. And that, I think, is one of the things that we should take seriously. From all of those different perspectives, I have heard no one 
no one who suggests that the government's policy objectives here around ensuring, for example, that everyone who's due to pay the Scottish income rate, of, uh, rate of income tax uh, pays it, no one who suggested that those policy objectives are not valid, not important. They are important. The argument here is that there is a better way to do this, a better way to deliver on those objectives, which doesn't create a single unique identifier which covers the whole breadth uh, of government uh, relationships and, and agencies. That, in effect, creates a single point of failure. If an error is made in that single centralised system, whole aspects of our lives could unravel as a result of that. And the, the single point of failure is one of the crucial elements uh, in the Open Rights Group's briefing, one of the crucial criticisms. They end that briefing, and I would uh, commend this to members who have not had a chance to read it. They end that that briefing by saying, is there an alternative? Yes, there's a better way to do this, an opt-in authentication service. No personal data need be stored, but it would allow the user to prove their identity to public and private bodies without having to provide passports and utility bills. It would reduce the scope for identity theft or fraud and make life easier for users without providing that single point of failure. Final I minute. really would encourage the Deputy First Minister, and I think he was listening seriously to these concerns in our meeting yesterday, I would encourage him to be open to these alternative approaches, which can be can learn from, can be informed by, but don't have to absolutely replicate everything the UK government is doing. And finally, one request I would make of him. I welcome the fact that he said there will be a full privacy impact assessment, and I welcomed when he set up the privacy uh, management group that was informed by a wide range of external experts, including people like Jerry Fishenden, Gus Hussain, Charles Rabb. Can I ask him please to make sure that that privacy impact assessment is conducted by that external group of experts, not by civil servants, because there are very many of us who are concerned that this is not SNP policy that's brought this here. It's long-standing civil service policy which has gone through changes of government. It's the job of this parliament to stand up for principles when the civil service tells us, Minister, this is the only way to do it. It's not, and I do hope the government will think again. Thank you very much. And I call Colin Keir, after which we'll turn to closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think I have to say at the outset that I vehemently oppose the implementation of an ID card system of the type that's been proposed previously in another place. The issue of civil liberties is one that we should be proud of, but certainly proud to stand up for without any hesitation. And I would certainly not support such legislation if it was being proposed. Since the preamble to this debate kicked off the other day in the media, I have heard some astonishing statements relating to this subject, slippery slopes, big brothers watching and the end of democratic society as we know it. And then I actually get sight of the motion, which, to be fair, is written in a reasonably temperate form of words talking about concerns and debate. I see nothing unreasonable about the motion under the name of John Swinney. As the Deputy First Minister has pointed out, if we are to have a broad use of services online, there has to be some form of information across various public bodies. And there has to be some way of identifying clearly that the subject of the ID process is the recipient of the service. And this morning, oddly enough, I was at a meeting at the Fire and Rescue Scotland Service Asset Resource Centre at Newbridge in my constituency. And at that meeting, senior uh, fire officers and others were discussing how the fire and rescue service would be running in the years ahead. And much of the work they'll be doing will be in relation to the preventative strategy. And this, of course, crosses into, amongst other things, health and social care issues, such as when a pensioner is being discharged back home. Now, this must, may be obvious. Possibly the pensioners are a bit wobbly in the feet, so a safety assessment could be asked for. Now, is there any reason why some sort of online request could be made from the recipient or others, uh, which could be made of the fire and rescue services. Now, this is not easy at the present time, and of course, work has to be done if we are to preserve civil liberties and while producing a modern system that works. But whatever, an ID has to be made. And more and more, we are using online services, and in many cases, old methods simply are not up to the job, and we are moving into areas that speed of decision-making is imperative and, of course, possibly with uh, the idea of it being cost-effective also. In terms of the issue of the Scottish Freedom of Income Tax, this may be one of the answers to the problem of how to actually identify a Scottish taxpayer. 
I know many members of the uh, Parliament's Public Audit Committee are concerned about how tax collection is audited as Audit Scotland don't have a primary role in the audit function. And at least we could have some comfort in being able to ID Scottish taxpayers, which will at least mean we can work out roughly if the numbers roughly match up with the snapshot produced by HMRC. The other thing that I find very strange is actually the way that Willie Rennie is complaining about the government and the way they brought forward the dealings on this subject. Quite clearly, it's just adding to the legislation that George Lyons brought some time ago. Now, call me a cynic if you like, but surely even Willie Rennie can see the hypocrisy here. What we're dealing here is consultation brought forward by the government. Different views we brought forward, worked on by ministers, civil servants, yes, civil servants, and hopefully an agreement can be made across the parties. There is no super, new super database here. I reckon it's too early, in my opinion, to make a huge song and dance about the subject before we see the proposals. And I have to say to the Liberal Democrats that using the tactic of manufacturing a crisis so you can run a campaign against it is something that we see on a regular basis in my constituency, and it really is a bit much. So why not act responsibly, please. debate the facts, and not the worst-case scenario, which will not happen? And I support the motion in the name of the Deputy First Minister. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Jackson Carlaw up to four minutes. Please, Mr Carlaw. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This has been an important debate, but in its brevity is in itself not a sufficient consideration of the issues before Parliament. And today the Scottish Government appears to be standing alone in its attempt to persuade us that these proposals are not worthy of the full scrutiny of the legislative process. Now I thought Willie Rennie set the argument out in the way in which he introduced his motion. The key being that we are moving from an opt-in system to a compulsory system, to no consent or proper knowledge and understanding of what is taking place. As Richard Simpson identified, there is a crucial difference between opting into something and finding that you have been opted into something without your knowledge. And whilst I might have doubts as to what the Botanic Gardens could do with the information that would be of insidious danger to the nature of individual citizens, it misses the point, because 120 public bodies are being offered this information and we should only be proceeding with primary legislation. And Christian, Christian Allard introduced, intervened on in a number of occasions, waving his ID about card about brandishing it and telling us there was no question of there being any ID cards following from this. I had no doubt that historically all those Frenchmen who marched for liberty, egality, fraternity were told the same thing. There would be no identity card as a result. And yet, Mr. Allard is the living proof that the long arm of the Elysee Palace reaches, <laughs> reaches into the billy du a la France in Mr. Allard's pocket that he was forced to wave before us today. Mr. Swinney was in his most defensive mode. I've never actually, I think, in all the years in this parliament, seen Mr. Swinney scrambling up ice without a pick and looking quite so rattled. When you see the Deputy First Minister being deployed in full sincerity mode, rather than the usual belligerent ministerial approach, alarm bells ought to ring. And the expostulations from uh, Rosanna Cunningham and other SNP ministers on the front bench really made me think of one thing, the arrogance of power. It happens to all administrations. The longer ministers are in office, the longer they believe in the centralisation of the state, the longer they believe they need to have the information, they need to be in control. And the SNP don't appreciate the irony, because after eight years in government, they are doing which in all the years of opposition, they used to rail against every other administration for doing when they saw it before them. And then we had Mrs Graham. This mustn't be, this mustn't, Miss Graham, this mustn't be party political. Miss Graham, you don't come naked into the chamber without form before you. Had any other government proposed this, you would have been throwing your jewellery at the ministers. Tesco, you cited. Tesco, you cited. A perfect example of people opting in, not being compulsorily enrolled in the Tesco database of information. And you said that the key test should be necessity. What necessity is there for the Botanic Gardens to have all this information, Mrs Graham? Up. Members in his last minute. I, I did make a comment. I wondered whether 120 organisations was appropriate, and I didn't know I'd opted into HMRC, WP, and Tesco. Yeah, 
but you obviously Jackson feel the Cameron. Botanic Gardens so need the information that you're prepared to support the government's approach this afternoon. When I hear the excuse, we live in the modern world, you know, I shudder because what it really is saying is that if in decades past, in other countries and in other regimes, this online scenario had been before them, would they have favoured the government's approach? I rather think they would. It's essential that parliamentary democracy prevails in these matters and they're fully debated, that light is thrown upon them and Thank a proper discussion be held on the direction our country is taking. That is all this motion is asking. Yep. Primary legislation, proper parliamentary scrutiny. The government may have some intentions that are laudable, as Patrick Harvey, we and others accept, but that is not a fig leaf they can hide behind by arguing that there is no major change. That call is no longer tenable. Many thanks. Now call on Dr Elaine Murray. Up to four minutes, please, Dr Murray. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's clear that the proposals held uh, on that information held on individuals in the National Health Service Central Register could be shared with a wide, wide range of other organisations has increasingly caused concern as the consultation drew to a close. Uh, and we've heard uh, about the BMA, the, the Royal College of uh, GPs, uh, and indeed the UK Inf Information Commissioner. And these are not politically biased people. These are people who actually genuinely have concerns that we need to listen to. The current purpose of the NHSRC is to permit the movement of medical records, as Drew Smith pointed out, for example, when a patient moves and transfers their records from one GP practice to another. Each patient has a unique citizen's reference number to ensure that they have only one set of medical records, and clearly that is in the benefit of the patient. At this at present time, the NHSRC does not hold postcode information, although the National Record of Scotland does have this information, which is provided by the health boards, and I think that's the CHI num number. A consultation document proposes adding uh, address postcode information to the unique property reference number which the NHS, uh, NHSCR already holds and to permit these to be shared with local authorities and health boards. Now, um, Christine Graham did make a valid point about the amount of information Tesco managed to glean about us when we do our shopping on our loyalty cards. However, I doubt that they're actually sharing any of this information, particularly with other uh, supermarkets. I mean, I find it uh, certainly, I always find it slightly worrying that they might hold, uh, share it with a health service who could find out whether you were buying alcohol or, or sweetened drinks and so on, but I don't think Tesco actually does share any of that sort of information. Uh, the changes to Schedule 2 of the NHSRC NHSCR regulations of 2006 would allow the sharing of all its information, including postcode and address codes with a number of health boards in England, Wales, Northern Ireland. Practising solicitors and charitable bodies can be advised that this information is contained on the register. They're not given it. They're told it's there. Uh, and the full name, gender and date of birth postcode and address reference code can be provided to HMRC. Now, that puzzles me slightly because I always thought we all get a national insurance number when we get old enough to, to take up employment. And surely the national insurance number, plus possibly an obligation, which could be introduced on HMRC to say where we live, would be enough in order to, to uh, tackle the issue of, of uh, uh, HMRC actually knowing who should have the Scottish tax code. Um, the, as others have said, uh, the uh, extension in Schedule 3 expands possibly uh, 120 uh, organisations, including indeed the Scottish Parliament, uh, to uh, be able to uh, find out about information which is, I quote, which has been provided by a body or a person specified in Schedule 3 but does not map that information. I don't know quite, quite whether that means that they can then check up that the information they got is correct or they can just check up that somebody else has got the information. Now, I can understand the rationale uh, that the Scottish Government wants to extend the online uh, public services system, my account, which is currently used in local government and the health service. I use the UK government one to uh, replace my tax system. It is a useful system to be able to do that. But what I question is whether in doing that, somebody else is then able to check all sorts of information. What, I mean, what's that <coughs> got to do with Prestwick in airport or the Forestry Commission, or the National Park. I mean, you know, if I use their, if I use my account to book something in the National Park, does that then guarantee that somebody else has the right to know something else about my information? I just don't understand the rationale uh, behind that. Uh, and as I say, I think that, you know, the HMRC, I, again, I agree with the government. We want to make sure that all Scottish taxpayers pay their income tax in Scotland. That's very important. But I don't think we need to do this okay, you need to, close, to go about please. it. 
And particularly, I think the, the issues are sufficiently serious, uh, raised by a whole number of, of other organisations, that they must not slip through as amendments to the 2006 regret you regulations. Need to close we must discuss this in Parliament in full so that we have the reassurance that we require on these issues. Many thanks. I now call on John Swinney. Up to six ministers, please, Deputy First Minister. Presiding officer, this uh, debate has been a useful opportunity to discuss issues upon which, as I indicated in my other remarks to Parliament, the Government has taken no final decisions. The consultation closed last week. We have had about 300 responses to the consultation, and the Government will consider all of those uh, responses and reply accordingly, just as my, um, uh, as my amendment to the motion suggests today. I think there, are, there is some fundamental misinformation at the heart of what colleagues have shared with Parliament today, and I, I want to just address some of that just now. The proposal at the heart of this uh, consultation is to enable a range of public bodies, and I accept that the list of public bodies is significant and comprehensive, and there is certainly plenty of scope for us to consider whether every one of those public bodies needs to have the ability to access uh, the uh, identity, identity verification that is proposed in the consultation exercise, and I will consider that in the consultation exercise. But at heart, this is about enabling public bodies to do exactly what is done today by local authorities in verifying whether or not people wish to have the concessionary bus pass. That is what is happening. So in response to Dr Murray's point, no more information is retained. It is simply a mechanism of checking is this person who they say they are to then enable them to do whatever they want to do online with the public services? And we're not creating a new database. Mr Rennie's been putting out press releases left, right and centre about the colossal costs of all of this. All that will be proposed is that in cases where the postcode of an individual is not currently on their NHS CR record, it will be added. That will be it. The postcode. That's all that will be added to the system to enable higher quality verification of the individuals being who they say they are. I'll give way to Elizabeth Smith. Elizabeth Smith. Uh, thank you. And, and I do accept the sincere uh, way in which the Deputy Finance Minister has addressed this. But it's more than that. That's the reason why there is such public concern about this, that there is one single database. And that's the, that's the concern that they will have. The, well, that public concern First has minister. been around. Well, will have been the issue has been around since the 1950s, and Parliament in 2006, under the previous Liberal Labour executive, put the NHS CR on a statutory footing in the Lears Act. What did my parliamentary colleagues at the time think they were voting for, Mr. Scott? As you wave at me about, if you want to make an intervention, Mr. Scott, please, well, here. it's maybe be nice to be here to hear the debate. But that is what will be added to the NHS CR. Now, we then go on to the, other, the next question about uh, the whole issue of tax collection. HMRC have asked us to consider whether or not this would be a practical way of proceeding. I accept the points that have been made by the health service bodies about these questions. I don't want to in any way put anybody off registering with a GP. But people come on to the NHS CR when they're born as a consequence have been given an NHS number when they are born in the hospitals of Scotland. And when they register with a GP, people become part of that. And this is all about ensuring that we are able to properly identify who should be paying the Scottish rate of income tax, because I don't want anybody who should be paying the Scottish rate of income tax avoiding paying the Scottish rate of income tax, because that money is due to, the, to, to be paid to support the public finances of Scotland, and it will become ever more significant in the years to come. Uh, to Harvey. Mr. Harvey. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful, and I, I don't want people to be able to avoid the Scottish rate of income tax any more than he does, but does he accept at least that the proposal to have a single unique reference number across a range of different functions appears, at least on the face of it, to breach his own privacy principles? And will he ensure that that privacy, privacy assessment is conducted by the experts who drew up those principles? The, 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 the privacy uh, assessment will be carried out uh, properly and appropriately, and I don't believe that it breaches the data privacy principles that we set out. Now, I want to come on. I obviously irked Mr Carlaw by 
actually trying to have a reasoned debate in Parliament. Maybe I should just make a hysterical contribution to Parliament every time. <laughs> and on that basis, I would compete with Mr Carlaw for the, uh, the, the, the most colourful contributions we can make. But the reason why I did it was because I think Parliament is being, the public are being fundamentally misled by a lot of the things that are being said about this issue. And I wanted to put dispassionately some clear information in Parliament. And Mr Carlaw might shake his head and say, nobody's been misled. Well, I just want to get, share two things with Parliament. Last night on television, Mr Rennie said, I mean, nobody has ever said this is about accessing NHS personal information. But regrettably, at four o'clock on Tuesday, yesterday, Mr Rennie put out a campaign email saying the plans would mean civil servants from 120 public agencies accessing a data database which includes NHS records. And that is purely nonsense. Absolute, shameful, total nonsense you by Mr Rennie. Tools, please. Can I give away? No. Yes, yep. but you must be brief, please. Can you not see the difference between records and personal information? I was drawing the distinction. He has failed to draw that distinction. I think that reflects poorly on him. I, I know precisely what you are doing, Mr Rennie. You're trying to scaremonger in this debate because you've run out of road on every other issue that you're on. In your last now, 10 seconds, please, officer, Mr Swin. Presiding officer, the government has said that we will listen carefully to the points that have been expressed. I had a perfectly constructive meeting with the Open Rights Group yesterday, and there will be issues that they've raised which are entirely worthy of consideration, as have the health organisations, as have the Information Commissioner. But the Information Commissioner correctly identifies to Parliament that the Lears Act was passed in 2006 to put the NHSCR on a statutory footing, and that the ability of the Registrar-General to give access to verify information to a wider range of bodies was provided for in regulation making power which was put to us by the Liberal Democrat Minister, the former member for Argyle really and must. Butte. So we are operating within the confines and the arrangements that Parliament has already legislated for, but I assure Parliament I will come back to Parliament and we can have all the debates we want about how to take forward an issue which has got practical implications for protecting the taxpayer base Many of Scotland thanks. and the access to our public services. Thank you. Now call on Alison McInnes to wind up the debate. Up to eight minutes, please. Thank you. Well, Liberal Democrats are pleased to have used our time in the Chamber today to debate privacy and the state. And we welcome uh, wholeheartedly the support of other opposition parties today and do hope that the SNP will reflect on the strength of feeling expressed today. Willie Rennie, Richard Simpson, Liz Smith and Patrick Harvey have clearly and coherently set out the risks and what's at stake, which is more than I can be said about Christian Allard's contribution, I have to say. Liberal Democrats will always strike to seek a fairer balance between individuals and the government at every level. And we've led the debate time and again in council chambers at Holyrood and at Westminster. We introduced laws governing DNA retention. We stopped plans for a snooper's charter and we abolished the intrusive ID card system. Now, speaking of which, some members here may recall the debate in this parliament on ID cards back in 2008. Fergus Ewing, then Minister for Community Safety, lauded the warning of the Information Commissioner. The more databases set up and the more information exchanged from one place to another, the greater the risk of things going wrong, he said. The more you centralise data collection, the greater the risk of multiple records going missing or wrong decisions about real people being made. Put simply, holding huge collections of personal data bring significant risks, end quote. Ministers ought to reflect on those previous anxieties. In 2008, the Scottish Government told us it was finding ways to share personal data securely and with the strictest controls without creating a large centralised database. Today, it's an altogether different story. Back then, the Minister urged us to look to Germany, where, and I quote Fergus again, the use of unique ID numbers and the storage of personal data on a central register are prohibited. Today, the Scottish Government is advocating the wholesale use exactly. of unique exactly. identifiers. Exactly. And in ignoring its own warnings, the privacy of each and every one of us could be compromised. Now, the Deputy First Minister has referred to the fact that George Lyon introduced the 2006 Act. Well, indeed he did. But as Willie Rennie highlighted, the proposed repurposing of this register is fundamentally different from what could have been envisaged then. 
because it's shifting from an opt-in to a mandatory system. And it's a unique single identifier system. There was never any suggestion anyone would seek to extend the scope of the NHS central register to allow access to 120 bodies. Of course. John Swinney. If that was the case, why was the provision put in statute for the access to be extended by regulation-making powers? Because um, it was hard to envisage how things would have moved on at that time. So, I mean, what we are saying now, absolutely, what we are saying now is that if civil servants are suggesting that this is a good way forward, it's time to say, no, let's do this by primary legislation. So, Colin Keir and others... I was not giving way at this time, Mr Doris. Took a very narrow way of defining privacy, but rightly, privacy campaigners, the SCBO, Noto ID, and the BMA, and many more, have spoken out. And on Monday, the frank and deeply critical verdict of the Information Commissioner's Office was revealed, and it bluntly warned against the creeping use of unique identifiers, such as the UCRN, which could become the national identity number by default. And that's a quote. The Information Commissioner's Office concluded that the proposals could breach Data Protection Act and the European Convention on Human Rights. And that's because they shift away from the current model based on consent and opting in, moving to what is in effect a compulsory system. He said the case has not been made as to why these organisations need our data and the required privacy impact assessments have not been carried out. And we should be alarmed that the consultation has got this far about extending access to the central register when it was not accompanied by these assessments, did not set out alternative solutions, additional security arrangements, costs or a timescale. And it lacked an analysis of the social, financial and technological implications of the scheme. And therefore people have not been able to respond properly to uh, such a limited consultation. And the Scottish Government has done nothing today to dispel these reasoned, principled concerns today. As well as any pointed out last October, John Swinney published, and I have no time, published the Scottish Government's principles for identity management. So it quite clearly says large centralised databases should be avoided. And if a public service organisation needs to link personal information from different systems and in databases, it should avoid sharing persistent identifiers. Less than six months later, in pursuit of nothing more than administrative expediency, he has turned his back on those principles. Now, of course, we need to means to verify our identity, and the government must be able to authenticate these to prevent fraud or establish entitlement. However, aggregating our personal information to the extent proposed and the use of the unique citizen recognition number, universal across the public sector, is unprecedented. Linking databases in this way is dangerous and illiberal because it opens up the possibility of tracking and mapping the public services access from birth. Powerful data mining and profiling would become conceivable. The aggregation of small bits of seemingly innocuous data to build a picture of an individual person, a child or an adult, while barring people from knowing what the state knows or indeed being able to correct errors in that data. Interventions from a sedentary position are no more welcome uh, today than they have ever been. As Professor Solove, an internationally known expert in privacy point, law, points out, privacy is often threatened not by a single egregious act, but by the slow accretion of a series of relatively minor acts. And in this respect, privacy problems resemble certain environmental harms, which occur over time through a series of small acts by different actors. And although society is more likely to respond to a major oil spill, gradual pollution by a multitude of actors often creates more problems. The UK government has specifically ruled out a national database on five separate grounds, including fears of national surveillance and risks to the security of a single database. As well as any highlighted, it is pioneering alternative approaches that avoid costly, unwieldy super databases. Presiding officer, a string of data breaches have eroded public confidence in the ability of the state to store and handle our personal information sensitively and responsibly. Personal information is regularly lost by the NHS. It's found in memory sticks in hospital car parks, it's left in public transport, or it's sent to the wrong address. There were more than 800 such NHS incidents between 2009 and 2013. Councils lost data on 360 occasions during the same period. We're now proposing, not we, the government is now proposing to allow 120 public sector organisations access to personal data via this enhanced and augmented central register. Why? 
We need to know why information should be disclosed minute. to each body. The merits of every claim to our personal data must be interrogated and not granted on a whim. Secondary legislation is intended to establish comparatively minor technical details, and the repurposing of this database is anything but minor. The risks are great, and this afternoon's short debate has only served to highlight how much more patently still needs to be evidenced and explored. So this must be the subject of the most meticulous scrutiny, meaningful engagement, and a vote of our entire Parliament. Only primary legislation can prevent creation of this shadowy, sweeping ID database by the back door. John Swinney's assurance this afternoon is not sufficient, and the only way we can assure that the risks are properly understood is to vote for this motion today. Thank you very much. And that concludes the debate on privacy and the state. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12492 in the name of Jim Hume on mental health. I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Mr Hume, if you are ready, I would call on you to speak to and move the motion, but only after I have advised the Chamber. We are now extraordinarily tight for time this afternoon, so please do not exceed your allocated time. Ten minutes, Mr Hume. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'll start by moving the motion in my name. Uh, from the outset, I, I want to take this opportunity to underline the importance of our hard-working and dedicated frontline NHS staff. They are the backbone of our NHS and deserve every support from government. We know that for too long many patients with mental ill health have suffered in silence. Much progress, thankfully, has been made in breaking the stigma attached to mental health, and individuals are now taking the brave step of telling the GP that they have a problem or talk to a friend, relative or charity. So it's frustrating and upsetting that when they do find the courage to come forward to help, they can't get the treatment and support they desperately need. We only have to think about the 795 suicides in 2013 to remind ourselves that ensuring early access to mental health services is vital. The excellent work of the Choose Life campaign should be commended. It's made huge advantages in tackling suicide rates in Scotland. But let's now build on that and look towards a zero-tolerance ambition in order to engender a cultural change that means we treat mental ill health before people get to that desperate stage. Sadly, last week, ISD figures disappointingly highlighted once again the continued problems facing mental health services across Scotland. And whilst today's debate is timely, an opportunity for the Parliament to give this important area of health and those patients affected by mental health issues the prominence that they do deserve. It's worrying, though, that we have a repeat of the same story on missed targets. The bottom line is that the government simply isn't delivering for patients suffering with mental ill health. And it's worrying the fact that mental health, health has become the Cinderella service of the NHS. To illustrate that point, I'll refer to last week's figures. For children and adolescent mental health services, we know that nationally the new 18-week targets are not being met. When you break that down, five health boards are still failing to meet the old 26-week target, and only half are meeting the new treatment target of 18 weeks. Educational psychologists are at a dangerous low, and for adult psychological services, once again, the 18-week target is not being met with 15.5% of patients facing weights of 19 to 35 weeks and 4.4% of patients waiting a staggering 35 weeks for treatment. Young and vulnerable people are being repeatedly let down by ministers. The lack of facilities and specialised wards for children and adolescents is forcing them to seek treatment in England, often aggravating their conditions because of harder adjustment periods away from home. There are currently no secure inpatient facilities for children in Scotland and their treatment has to be planned on an ad hoc and temporary basis. There are no inpatient facilities at all for young people with mental health problems in Aberdeenshire with the closest such facilities located more than 50 miles away in Dundee, causing, causing even more distress for those young people and their parents, something I know my colleague Alice McInnes has raised often. The Mental Welfare Commission identified that 202 children last year were treated in adult wards. Kindred Scotland, who support around 900 families with children that have additional support needs, they told me that around 60% of those families have a mental health referral. They are raising a red flag for the increasing need of children and adolescent mental health services 
to be delivered as some fa families reach a crisis point before they're able to get a diagnosis. This leads to isolation of these families who need urgent access to staff and services of behavioural support, specialist schooling and even medication, which they can't access without CAMHS support. We know that without proper early support, young people run the risk of self-harm, and this is reflected in the BBC figures, showing that the number of young people admitted to hospital for self-harm has doubled in the past five years in some areas in Scotland. The fact that the government has let this concerning trend occur, I think, is a reflection on its failure to provide adequate resources and early support for mental health care. And this is so crucial when we think about mental health health care by focusing resources where they're most needed to encourage early intervention, we can reduce the number of youngsters being admitted to hospital for self-harm and we can pull back from the brink of suicide. John Mason. Thank you. Way. I, I wonder, he says there should be more resources for mental health. Is, is there any suggestion where that would come from? Would that be from the physical health budget? Jim Hume. If, if you look at the government's uh, uh, actual record on it, the government have uh, reduced their funding for health research budget from £4 million in 2008-2009 to just 860000 So it's about prioritisation. Ministers have to listen to the experts that are telling this. They're warning about problems in training, recruitment and retention of the mental health workforce. The Scottish Children's Health Services Coalition have told me that they consider the red flag has been raised on an impending tipping point in terms of educational psychologists across Scotland. The government in 2012 removed the funding for bursaries paid to each trainee, resulting in a drop of 70% in the applications for these courses. The number of children with additional support needs has more than doubled, reaching 140. 1,542 children in 2014. That means one educational psychologist for more than 356 children. That intense workload is sadly being echoed across other fields in mental health services, including the adult psychological treatment services, where a particularly worrisome rising trend seems to be developing. Two-fifths of GPs are not referring patients for psychological treatments either because of the ballooning waiting times or just lack of provision. And it's not just me saying this, it's the GPs themselves. These are the words of two GPs responding to a Sam H survey, and I quote, access to psychological, psychological therapies is extremely poor with long and unacceptable wait times. GPs feel under pressure not to refer people to already stretched services, unquote. And, and I quote, we do not have adequate access to non-pharmaceutical treatment options. We have no access to psychological therapies in our remote rural, rural areas. It just makes me very angry, unquote. Thank Jimmy Hepburn. Hume, for giving way, he mentioned the uh, Sam H uh, survey of GPs. Would he recognise, though, where he talks of 40% uh, of GPs not referring uh, due to lack of availability? That was actually 40% of those who said they hadn't referred. And when you actually looked at the figures, it was 8% of the GPs responding. And that was, I confirmed that with Sam H when I discussed it with him. Jim well, you, you'll have to go and get Sam H to put that on the record because that's the, their briefing. Uh, so mi ministers have sidelined, ma uh, again, mental health issues. And while the government claims to have improved the services by hiring more people and reducing more times for numbers of patients, last week's ISD t uh, numbers tell another story. Only 81% of patients referred for adult psychological therapies began their treatment within the 18 weeks target and only three of the 14 NHS boards reached this target. Now, and how about those patients who had or have been waiting for more than the 18 weeks target time, with nearly 250 patients waiting for more than an entire year to begin their treatment? If the government believes there are sufficient resources, then that is not reflected in the views of the professionals, the charities, or indeed the stats. That is a worrying prospect, given our ageing population who often present with complex mental health needs. Indeed, the British Psychological Society have underlined the disparity in the number of psychologists employed in older adult services, which is only 35 out of a workforce of appro approximately 726 whole-time equivalent psychologists, placing older adults at a marked disadvantage in terms of their access to specialist psychological assessment and intervention. Just last year, we were promised a report by the then Minister for Public Health, which would follow up with a 10-year review of the grant report of 2003 by the end of 2014. So I look forward to the new Minister to address this issue. When the Mental Health Strategy was published in 2012, 
The Government then said improving mental health and treating mental illness are two of our major challenges. Unquote. And yet we know that the mental health research budget has been cut from £4 million in 2008 2009 to £860,000 this year. That's about government priorities. Such a drastic cut doesn't such a drastic cut doesn't stack up against those warm words. So I hope the Minister will update Parliament on what shape any new strategy will take beyond 2015. Deputy Presiding Officer, surely one of the biggest health inequalities that currently exists within the NHS is the treatment of mental ill health. There is an obvious lack of parity between what the system deems acceptable for someone with a physical health complaint and what the system deems acceptable for someone with a psychological health complaint. Just as we would not allow someone with a broken bone to wait for months at a time to be seen and treated, why does the Scottish Government allow people with issues of mental ill health to wait for more than six months for treatment and in some cases for more than a year? I hope that Ministers will agree that this needs to be addressed by putting mental health on the same footing as physical health and urge the Scottish Government to follow the UK Government's lead and lay out quite clearly in legislation that mental and physical ill health are recognised equally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity. I now call on Jamie Hepburn. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And, uh, let me say I will try and respond to uh, some of the points that Mr Hume and others raise uh, in closing. But can I say at the outset, I very much welcome uh, the opportunity for a further debate on Scotland's mental health. I believe this is the third uh, parliamentary debate we have had on mental health this uh, calendar year. And in the first, which uh, I secured immediately upon us returning after the Christmas uh, recess, I think there was a, a clear uh, consensus that we should be debating this uh, subject matter uh, more often. I am very glad that we seem uh, to be doing so. I think it is very important, I think it is vitally important that this uh, Parliament is engaging and bringing uh, the issue to the fore. Can I say at the outset I should uh, move uh, the amendment in my name, so I do not forget to do so at the end. And in doing so, I hope it is uh, recognised it is worded in a way that is to try and capture uh, much of the essence of uh, the original uh, motion, uh, just trying to place uh, matters in a bit of a better uh, context. And I should say, I believe uh, Dr Simpson's amendment does that to an extent as well. And in the event of the government amendment not passing, we will uh, support Dr Simpson's uh, amendment. Uh, President, officer, mental health is a, a subject that touches us uh, all, whether we uh, have a, a mental health problem, whether we are a carer for someone who has a mental health problem, or whether we have family, friends or colleagues who have had a, a mental health problem. It is estimated uh, that mental health disorders affect more than a third of the population every year. It is therefore vital that we continue with breaking down the stigma of mental ill health. See me as uh, Scotland's national campaign to end mental health stigma and discrimination is, of course, hosted by the uh, Scottish Association for Mental Health. I should say I believe we have made enormous progress in tackling uh, stigma, but the Scottish Social Attitude Survey published last year, late last year, shows that the work of uh, See me is still uh, needed. People are still experiencing a uh, negative attitude because of their mental health problem, and uh, people often self uh, stigmatise, avoiding uh, events and not wanting to talk about their uh, illness. The refounded See as activity planned around, for example, equality and human rights, the workplace and settings where people experience discrimination. I think that emphasises the role that we all have, employers, communities, friends, media and others, to end the uh, stigma of uh, mental uh, ill health. And I should say uh, that was why I wanted to emphasise, and I know that Mr Hume did uh, say in his opening uh, contribution, but in my amendment I wanted to say that not only do we absolutely should uh, thank uh, uh, and support our uh, NHS staff working in this area, but we should also uh, support uh, the third sector and uh, see me uh, as a great uh, example uh, of uh, that uh, work. Uh, there are uh, other ways we can uh, start to end uh, mental health uh, discrimination. There has been a uh, debate around parity of mental health and physical health, and we have just heard that uh, uh, raised again by uh, Mr Human, which is a particular uh, issue of interest to him. He has raised this uh, on a number of occasions. As I have set out previously, uh, President Officer, the National Health Service Scotland Act 1970 already states that Scottish ministers have a duty to secure improvements in the physical and mental health of the people of Scotland. It does not distinguish between the two, nor does it place a higher importance on one over the other. Our Scottish NHS has a duty to promote the improvement of health, a duty that extends equally to the areas of physical and mental health. And in giving way uh, to Mr Hume, I am sure that is something he will want to uh, recognise and acknowledge. Jim Hume. The 1978 Act, which applies to Scotland, does state that it, it, it 
has the improvement in the physical and mental health of the people of Scotland, but the Act, the Health and Social Care Act that applies to England of 2012, actually states that it, it wants the improvement in the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of physical and mental health. So it actually highlights that uh, separately. Well, of course, and I, I thought I expected Mr. Hume would raise that point, and I'm aware that's what Section 1 of the Health and Social Care Act 2012 says. Let me uh, read out for uh, you in the Chamber, President Officer, what Section 1 of the National Health Service Scotland Act 1978 says. It shall continue to be the duty of the Secretary of State, now Scottish Minister, to promote in Scotland a comprehensive and integrated health service designed to secure improvement in the physical and mental health of the people of Scotland and the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of illness. Mr. Hume, that covers both physical and mental illness. What I will say, though, uh, President Officer, is I am more than happy to uh, discuss this matter uh, with Mr Hume, and if he uh, believes or perceives that there is some form of legislative vehicle that uh, would be uh, opposite for this, I am happy uh, to consider uh, the matter. But I think it is fundamentally important that we recognise it is already the case that in uh, legislation terms, there is already parity between uh, mental and physical uh, health. Uh, I should also say, uh, President Officer, uh, my portfolio uh, also includes sport and health improvement. I think this uh, should hopefully signal and understand how, how supporting the mind uh, supports uh, the body and how supporting the body uh, supports uh, the mind. I fundamentally believe uh, that improving access to physical activity can make an important difference to uh, a person's uh, sense of mental well-being. I am very determined to bring the influence of sport to bear on improving uh, Scotland's uh, mental health. But I am also clear uh, that we must improve access to mental health services because some of us will experience uh, mental health problems just as some of us will become physically unwell. And this is why uh, we have developed access targets for psychological therapies and uh, child and adolescent mental health services. And we should recognise that Scotland was the first nation in the UK to introduce a target to ensure a faster access to psychological therapies. For all ages, the uh, target for boards is that patients get a referral to treatment for psychological therapies within 18 weeks. This is a, a challenging target. We should recognise the work that boards have been uh, undertaking to try and meet it. The latest uh, data shows that the uh, average adjusted uh, waiting time for psychological therapies is eight weeks. 81.4 per cent of people were seen within 18 weeks. Some boards are doing better than others. We are offering support to boards to tackle uh, waiting lists. Uh, let me say there has been progress made. I recognise that it is not significant enough and I expect all boards uh, to meet uh, this target. That's why we have embedded it into NHS Scotland's local delivery plan guidance for 2015-2016. Uh, Turning to uh, CAMS, uh, the uh, mental health of our children and seconds. young people uh, have uh, been a focus of our efforts to improve Scotland's mental health. We have increased the specialist child and adolescent mental health services workforce by almost 24 per cent uh, since 2009. Uh, the la latest data shows uh, that more people are being seen within 18 weeks. The average waiting time is uh, seven weeks. That is an improvement, but it's still not good enough. And uh, this week, uh, sorry, last week, uh, President Officer, I was in contact with those health boards who didn't reach uh, the target in uh, the latest figures. I've been assured we will continue uh, to see uh, progress. Again, I'm Must determined close, that we please. meet uh, that uh, target. Uh, ensuring the prompt treatment of people experiencing uh, mental health is a key priority for improving uh, Scotland's uh, mental health. I'm glad that we have had uh, this third opportunity to debate mental health in 2015. I look forward to uh, keeping a, a strong focus on this area and responding uh, to points raised in the debate later. Uh, President mm -hmm. Officer. Thanks very much. I now call on Dr Richard Simpson to speak to and move Amendment 12492.3. Dr Simpson, up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I refer members to my declaration and I move the motion in my name in case I forget. I am pleased to be opening this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour, and if the Chamber will forgive me, I propose to concentrate entirely on child and adolescent services. In 2006, uh, the Coalition Labour, Liberal Democrat Labour laid out some challenges facing CAMS. This included building the workforce and ensuring that the number of those under 18 being admitted to non-specialist units was halved by 2009. Now, building a workforce does take time, and it is to both administrations' credit that up to 2011, the numbers increased, particularly in psychology and nursing staff. However, since, since 2009, the number of full-time equivalent consultants has gone down and vacancies are going up. The number of family therapists has reduced by a third. Moreover, 28% of all the staff are on temporary contracts, and this cannot be good for a service to have that level of temporary contracts. The 2006 Labour Government's CALMS framework stated very clearly that adequate, and I stress the word adequate, 
uh, st staffing, minimum staffing levels required a level of 15 per 100,000 population. Today, eight years on, seven boards do not have that level. Amongst the worst is my own board, Fourth Valley, at 8.3. They're also one of the worst performing boards for waiting times. And on closer inspection, we find that their referral figures uniquely exclude Tier 2 provision, i.e. they only report referral times on Tiers 3 and 4. Anyone referred to Tier 2 has to wait, when I finish the sentence, has to wait six months for an assessment. Six months for an assessment. They have to wait that. Not median, not average, not the longest. Six months for an assessment. So why is this board not being placed in some sort of special measures for calms in the same way as the Royal Alexandra Hospital and now WI have for the accident and emergency? Is that equality between physical and mental health? Jimmy Hepburn. For giving way. I mean, to be, he does raise a fair point that there are vacancies uh, there in CAM services. I would recognise that. Would he recognise that as part of the challenge? And I, he would accept, and this is one of the things I absolutely discussed with each of the health boards last week, he would accept that the health boards are trying to fill these vacancies. Yep, I would accept that. But in 2009, I went to Welfare Commission, welcomed the fact that the target had been reached, halving the number of admissions to non-specialist units, but they emphasised that progress had to be maintained. Now, Labour had planned new and refurbished inpatient specialist beds to take the numbers up to 57. Unfortunately, in an answer to a question in October last year, SMP uh, confirmed that only 42 beds are currently commissioned, though with six more to be opened. That's still only 48. Now, the result of that is that admissions reported by the MWC have actually risen by 40 per cent from 141 in 2012 to 202 this December. So my question to the Minister is what target has he set for pro progress in reducing admissions, either by more beds or by more of the innovative community intensive services such as we have in Fife? Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, as I always do, I praise the Government when they do something right. So the introduction in 2010 of the UK's first heat waiting times target of 26 weeks by March 2013, 18 weeks by December 2014, was welcome. But last year we saw an increase in the numbers waiting more than 52 weeks from 20 to 226. The 26-week target has still not been met by five boards. Not the 18-week target, the 26-week target. Deputy Presiding Officer, the SNP also promised last year that the 10-year follow-up to the 2003 SNAP, that is the Needs Assessment Programme Report, uh, would be published in 2014. When will it be published? It hasn't yet been so. I want to finish, Deputy Presiding Officer, on a concern which I believe the Government must investigate. The latest ISD figures are no longer developmental, they are now credible. But in the past year, out of, uh, uh, sorry, out of 26,800 referrals, 5,100 were, quotes, rejected. The ISD definition, when I asked them about this, is that they were deemed inappropriate. That is, one in five referrals were rejected. But, once again, and for the first time since the waiting list scandal in Lothian, we see a massive variation in the number of rejections. 5.6% in one board, indeed not in one of the island boards, but I don't think that's relevant, through clusters, which may be more relevant, of 11 to 13% in two boards. But there are two boards with over 27% rejections. Now, there are clear guidelines as to what you refer for on the websites, very clear guidelines, and yet we're having more than one in four patients being, referrals being rejected. The Cabinet Secretary must investigate this extraordinary variation and, more importantly, what actually then happens to these rejected children. Must close. And finally, Presiding Officer, I welcome the support for the mental health programme of 15 million, but if the mental health services received their same share as in 2009, they would be currently £75 million better off every year. They are being shortchanged. I Many thanks. I now call on Dr Milne. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I hope it's a good sign for the many people waiting for help to cope with mental health challenges that this is the second parliamentary debate on mental health this year, with a stage one debate on the Mental Health Scotland Bill to follow next week. It's right that the Parliament should be focusing on mental health, because one in four of us will have to deal with a mental illness at some time in our lives. And mental health is just as important as physical health. Indeed, our physical well-being is influenced significantly by our mental and psychological welfare. 
The appointment of a minister with specific responsibility for mental health is hopefully an indicator that the Scottish Government is taking this seriously, and I welcome the tone of the Government's amendment today, which acknowledges that physical and mental health are equally important, and accepts that whilst progress is being made, there do remain very significant challenges, particularly in the provision of psychological services for children and adolescents. It is moreover widely acknowledged that there is a lack of provision generally, especially in deprived areas and for people with long-term conditions like dementia, diabetes and heart problems. With many of the commitments in the Mental Health Strategy to 2015 as yet unmet, there is clearly no room for complacency and increasing efforts are needed urgently to meet the needs of the many people who require help. In the short time allocated to me, I want to focus on just two of the strategy's commitments highlighted by Sam H in his briefing for the debate. There has quite rightly been a lot of comment in recent weeks on the failure to achieve Commitment 13 to provide access to psychological therapies within 18 weeks of referral by the end of December last year, the benchmark of success being that 90% of people should have met this target. In reality, only five health boards met the target and more than 16,000 people are still on the waiting list, of whom 3.9% have waited between 36 and 52 weeks and 1.5% more than a year. This really isn't good enough. And what is particularly worrying is that we have indeed been told by Sam H, although the Minister disagrees, that 40% of GPs that they contacted have said they have not even referred people recently for psychological therapies because of the long waiting times. So we really have no idea of real unmet need. The Government faces a major challenge if the 18-week target is to be delivered before the end of this year. And beyond that, Sam H is quite right to recommend that talking therapies should actually be included in the 12-week target in order to put mental health on a par with physical health. Linked to this is the current failure to achieve Commitment 15 of the Mental Health Strategy to increase local knowledge of social prescribing opportunities. It is well known how beneficial simple activities like walking and gardening, art classes and just being able to talk over problems with one's peers can be in coping with mental stress and depression. And if the 90% of GPs who told Sam H they wanted more information on such activities locally did have this information, the benefits in terms of early intervention and reduction in prescription drugs would, I am sure, be significant. The placing of mental health trained link workers in GP surgeries in areas of extreme deprivation where mental health issues are very common is a promising pilot scheme which allows these workers to intervene early and signpost patients to community services and the support which comes from social activities. Now that this pilot has been extended uh, to 2018, hopefully in time other GP practices could benefit from this sort of approach, particularly as health and social care integration develops and evolves across Scotland. It's just to uh, agree, we obviously hold it great hope for that as a project you would, uh, I beg pardon, the member would uh, presumably agree though, we must uh, thoroughly assess the efficacy of that programme before we roll it out further. Annette Milne. I agree with that, absolutely, um, but I, I think it's a very worthwhile uh, pilot. Increasing social prescribing shouldn't be too difficult to achieve because many communities already have the activities in place which would benefit people with mental health issues. But improved access to psychological services will require, more, will require more investment, not only in trained psychologists, but in nurses who are trained in cognitive behavioural therapy, who under good supervision and governance can help to achieve the government's heat target for accessing psychological therapies. Surely, with a commitment to caring for people in the community and avoiding the need for hospitalisation wherever possible, such investment right across the country is the way to go. Presiding officer, such a short debate gives little time to deal with the many challenges to achieving mental well-being for people who need health, for children and young adults dealing with depression, bereavement, bullying and many other stresses which can become overwhelming, and for the increasing number of older people with chronic ailments or facing the traumas of dementia. Much work remains to be done, but at least this is now recognised, and hopefully the next phase of the mental health strategy will focus on what remains to be achieved with realistic targets aimed at putting mental and physical health on an equal footing and helping the hard-working staff in the field to get the results which they desire and which patients deserve. Presiding officer, to conclude, we will support the motion and also the amendments from Labour and the Scottish Government. Many thanks. I now move to more open debate, and I call on Bruce Crawford to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Crawford. Thank you, President Novasa. Like other opening speakers, I want to start my contribution to this important debate today by recognising and paying tribute to the outstanding work done in this area by hard-working health professionals across the country. As we all know, um, health, mental illness is one of the 
major public health challenges in Scotland today. Well, as much has been achieved, there is much work still to be done, and as we constantly strive to improve the service offered in the field. In the debate today, President Officer, I hope to illustrate some of the challenges faced by those working in this area and also some of the work being done to overcome these very challenges. Jim Hewn's motion notes that one in four people will experience a mental health problem during their lifetime. I think we know that the reality is that no matter what the statistics tell us, that many more of our population than one in four will suffer from a mental health illness at some time in their life. But I think we can also say with some certainty is that the level of demand on the health service to provide help to those who are suffering from mental health illness is only likely to grow. Much of that increase in demand is, of course, driven by specific hardships of modern life and, in particular, by financial challenges and poverty. I do not want to get into the impact of the UK's welfare reform today and the rise of food banks is having on people's mental health and their families, but we can't simply ignore these matters. Our job today is to debate in a responsible way what we can do to improve the service for those who have a mental health illness and decided to seek professional help. So here we have a growing challenge. The budget that is still rising significantly is not able to keep pace with the sheer scale of increasing demand. So, of course, a challenge that we face and see across the health sector in its widest sense. But frankly, we cannot simply continue to throw resources at these challenges because we all know uh, in future that the, how limited our capacity to do so will be curtailed as a result of further public expenditure cuts. It is clear that in the Forth Valley Health Area, as, this was, disclosed, as was, was discussed by Richard Simpson, uh, both in child and adolescent mental health services and psychological therapy services are under significant pressure, and the statistics do not make for comfortable reading. But this only serves to emphasise the scale of the challenge we face. But this is not a debate about statistics and numbers on a page. This is a debate about the quality of life of individuals and their families, and what health boards and we as government and as a parliament can do to make improvements. Now, no government or health service goes out to create such conditions, and they are usually as a result of a range of complex circumstances that are not easily resolved, but resolve them we must. To help me understand the specific challenges facing Forth Valley, Forth Valley I asked them to let me know what action they are taking to resolve them. They were able to inform me that they are facing significant workforce challenges in both Camet Chess and psychological therapy services. In addition, they told me they are committing an additional half a million pounds a year on a recurring basis and that recruitment is now underway for two nurses and two consultants, as well as further staffing changes for Camet Chess. In the area of psychological services, they intend to recruit a head of service and fill five additional posts in the near future, as well as introduce additional clinics. Now, it all depends, obviously, on what the market for recruitment can provide for them, but it is obviously a significant challenge ahead. In addition, they also intend to prevent a number of waiting time initiatives to help improve efficiency and productivity of their mental health services. And I sincerely hope that the actions they are taking will have the desired impact and lead to significant improvement. Those with a mental health illness who rely on our health service deserve for this debate to be focused on where improvement plans can help deliver change for the better. And I recognise the tone of both the motions from Jim Hume and the amendment from Richard Simpson, but I think the Minister's uh, uh, amendment captures better close, the please. sense of where we are and the context, and therefore I'll be supporting the Minister at decision time. Many thanks. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by John Mason. Uh, President officer, like other members, I am full of praise and admiration for those who work in mental health services, and I also acknowledge, uh, in terms of the government's actions, both the continuity uh, of policy in general terms between uh, this and the previous administration, and also the progress that has been made in several areas. But it is right that in debates such as these, we highlight uh, the problems and uh, for me, the problems come obviously both as a constituency MSP, but also people draw attention to various issues uh, since I'm co-convener of the cross-party group on mental health. I'm bound to be concerned, therefore, at the figures uh, for referral for uh, child and adolescent mental health services that came out last week. Only 54 per cent of young people in Lothian uh, are um, accepted uh, within 18 weeks 
and it's not much higher at 63% uh, within 26 weeks. So clearly there are big uh, issues there and it's not just for Lothian. I pay tribute to the Ch Scottish Children's Services Coalition and they say in, this, in regard to this issue, I quote, we are at a crisis point and high level strategic management is required in order to get a grip on the situation. The question of unmet need has also come up in this debate. Richard Simpson uh, talked about the uh, uh, referrals that are rejected and we can't assume that in those health boards where 27% are rejected that there isn't a need uh, in terms of a service for those 27 of people. We haven't heard specifically in terms of uh, young people that GPs are not referring uh, because of the problems uh, with those waiting, but uh, I think we should certainly remember the quote that uh, Jim Hume made and the evidence of SAMH in terms of adult services. We can argue about the percentages, but the fact of the matter is that SAMH do quote uh, from a GP saying GPs feel under pressure not to refer people to already stretched services, and that is a very uh, striking uh, comment on the situation. <coughs> We're also concerned, as Richard Simpson emphasised, in terms of children and adolescents in non-specialist settings. This was legislated for in the Mental Health Act 12 years ago, and perhaps we can revisit it when we, when we return to that Act uh, next week. But progress there does seem to have stalled. Now, clearly, the preventative agenda is very important here. Early intervention um, and projects like Place to Be, which operate, for example, in Fourth View School in my uh, constituency, and, of course, uh, educational psychology which we've debated in another debate uh, recently. But the issue I highlighted at health questions is also relevant because clearly the mental health uh, problems of, of women around the time of birth are a massive problem for them but also for their children. And while I again paid a uh, tribute at question time to the specialist uh, uh, perinatal, perinatal community team in Lothian, we know that many areas of Scotland are lacking services uh, for perinatal mental health services. And that is very important for young people People as well. Eating disorders we debated last week, again a massive mental health issue for young people but since the debate last week actually I had a consultation with a mother who was telling me actually her daughter got quite a good CAM service for eating disorders. As soon as she became 18 she fell off a cliff and I'm currently um, uh, taking up with NHS Lothian what is available for her now she is designated as uh, an adult. Now clearly the wider preventative agendas are important. The Choose Life campaign has been mentioned. See Me has been mentioned. These, 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 these were great campaigns and I was pleased to be associated them, with them when they started. But clearly more needs to be done there as well. And in the last mental health debate, I paid a, a tribute to Laura Nolan from Edinburgh, who was actually nominated as one of the Evening Times Women uh, of the Year. And the work she is doing uh, to help those who are at risk of suicide in terms of uh, providing services for them and also in terms of spreading the awareness of mental health in schools. So clearly this uh, should be a collaborative exercise. Uh, mental health is an issue for everyone. And I hope uh, we will all follow the great example of Laura Nolan and do our bit as well as urging the government to take their responsibilities as well. Many thanks. Now call on John Mason to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Up to three minutes, please. Welcome uh, the return to mental health as a subject for debate. I think there's a lot of agreement across this chamber that we need to put more emphasis on mental health, but we are maybe not entirely clear how to do that. Uh, stigma has been mentioned in previous debates and again today. And partly I think it's a question of time taken for attitudes to change. But that does not mean we should not keep talking about it and so try and help to change these attitudes. Uh, I think I have mentioned uh, before a new care home uh, which has been built in my constituency, which everyone was quite happy about until it transpired that the residents would have mental health issues. And that provoked quite a reaction from part of the local community. Uh, I have been in visiting them and they would be delighted if either the First Minister or Mr Hepburn uh, was able to visit or uh, open the home. I am interested in some of the words and phrases that appear in the Lib Dem motion, and uh, firstly, there is mention of the word targets, which we are all familiar with. Uh, just this morning at the Finance Committee, we were discussing preventative spending and the need to shift resources in that direction. Now, targets are not necessarily in contradiction to preventative spend, but there is a, great, a certain danger with targets that they focus on what is easily measured and the short term. So while in this case the targets focus on uh, psychological therapies, which I think we can accept are preventative, uh, I think it is worth saying too at this stage that targets can sometimes take our eye off the long-term goals. 
Secondly, the phrase adequately resource mental health services. Now, what does this actually mean? Does it mean reducing the resources for physical health, which I think there is an argument for, but I think we should be open about that if the plan is to reduce the number of hospitals for physical health and perhaps cut down the A&E availability. I think you can argue for that, but I think it should be spelled out. Thirdly, we have the phrase, parity is enshrined in law. Now, what does this actually mean? Does it mean actual equal amounts of money spent on mental and physical health? Does it mean an equal number of inpatient beds for mental health and physical health? Now, I understand that used to be the case in the 1970s when I used to visit patients in Lennox Castle and Gartloch and elsewhere. And surely it is not desirable that we go back to that situation. It's much better to have more help in the community. Now, very quickly. Thank you. Some discussion, obviously, about the two different acts, the 1978 one, which covers Scotland, and the 2012 one. Just to make it very clear again, the 1978 act that covers Scotland, that the minister seems to be content with, with uh, talks about improvement in the physical and mental health of the people of Scotland, whereas the, this, uh, the Health and Social Care Act 2012 says the, the prevention, I, I agree. diagnosis, John and Mason, treatment please of continue. physical and mental health. Yeah, I agree to take a short amendment, but I'm sorry about that. The final point, then, I'm also intrigued by the term zero suicide ambition, which I would very much agree with and welcome the reduction in recent years. But I suspect zero suicides is incredibly difficult to achieve. I also wonder how that fits in with the concept of assisted suicide. I tend to think that shows up one of the problems we have with assisted suicide, that there is often a link with mental health issues. The actions of this parliament can be symbolic, and if we say assisted suicide is acceptable, we are also making a strong statement that when someone faces problems in life, suicide is a valid way out. I don't think we I'm want to send out that message. Close. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Roderick Campbell, up to three minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Jim Hume's motion rightly acknowledges, mental health issues are universal. Few families will be untouched by the need for professional help at some stage in their lives. Mental health is clearly a major public health challenge, more common in socio-economic deprived areas and regions. Indeed, we only have to look to Greece in the last few years to understand the impact of austerity on the mental health of that society. And Inclusion Scotland, in their briefing, uh, su suggests that there is significant evidence that those with mental health conditions have been disproportionately hit by sanctions from both uh, Job Seekers Allowance and Employment su Support Allowance. Public perception remains vitally important too. Too often in the past, people unfortunate enough to suffer from a mental illness were stigmatised and excluded by society. With the sterling work of the See Me campaign launched in 2002, internationally recognised an example of best practice, we've moved a long way. Today, there's much more openness. Celebrities such as Stephen Fry talk openly about bipolar disorder. Mental disorders are, of course, not uniform. Women are more likely to suffer from depression than men, while the association between poor mental health and disability is clear. But suicide is disproportionately male particularly affecting young men, and in Scotland we have high rates of suicide compared to the European average. Why that is, is clearly complex. Issues of self-esteem, family breakdown, relationship difficulties, drug use in particular all play a part, as indeed will economic factors. Indeed, some academics and researchers call it the Scottish effect. What's true, however, is that the suicide rate in 2012 was amongst the lowest for 25 years. Although it increased last year, it will be interesting to see whether in 2014 a downward trend is established again. What we do know for sure is that suicide rates are strongly related to deprivation. We need to encourage individuals, nevertheless, not to suffer in isolation. And at the very least, speaking openly to a friend or family member is becoming less of a feared encounter as a result of a better understanding and awareness of the importance of mental health. Initiatives not only that of See Me, but that of Choose Life and Scottish Recovery are important. And this government, in my view, recognises the need, amongst competing financial pressures, to invest in mental health. In relation to psychological therapy, therapies, the figures for some boards are disappointing, but we should not forget that the shortage of cognitive behaviour therapies in itself is an issue. There's clearly a demand that cannot be solved with a stroke of the pen which is why, important, this is why it's important that other issues, such as the use of online technology, be explored. As for children and young people, the nature of our society means that the demand is not slowing down. It's disappointing that half the health boards are not meeting targets, but I'm encouraged that these boards have action plans in place to address this, and I have no doubt that those boards will recognise the need to respond to concerns.
And let's please. also not forget, as the Minister has said, improvements in general health by changing people's diets, by encouraging physical activity, by reducing smoking, by tackling levels of drug and alcohol dependency, and the awareness of the threats of new psychoactive substances all play a part. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Now move to closing speeches. Call on Mary Scanlon. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Scanlon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, the members today for some excellent speeches. And I would also say a tone that befits this topic. I would remind some of the newer members that uh, there was an Audit Scotland report done six years ago uh, the overview of mental health services. And at that time, 142 children were referred to adult wards. And the SNP gave a commitment then. And instead of 142, we've now got 202. And I'm sorry, presiding officer, but I have to say that every single thing that was recommended here has been raised as a problem again today. So I hope our new minister will take time to read this because uh, there's a fair bit of deja vu in there. I want to start no less than four minutes and you've got a chance to sum up. I want to start with uh, uh, psychological services, given that there's 16,000 people uh, on the waiting list. I also think that uh, if the government is serious about inequalities, they should start with mental health, given that 43% of people on benefits have a mental health issue. But for psychological therapies, the Minister would do well to read sign guideline 114, non-pharmaceutical management of depression in adults, published in January 2010 and due to be considered for review two years ago, but that didn't happen either. Paragraph 9.1 describes the provision of psychological therapies, I think every member has mentioned today, as patchy, idiosyncratic and largely uncoordinated. Well, that was five years ago. So the Scottish Government has had five years to address the patchy, idiosyncratic and uncoordinated services and they failed, absolutely failed. The guideline also states, five years ago, NHS Education Scotland is working in partnership with the Government, the NHS boards, other service providers to increase the capacity within the current NHS workforce to deliver psychological therapies. Well, where are they? Every member from every side has mentioned the lack of workforce planning and workforce. And now we have a situation five years later where local doctors don't even bother referring because there's nothing to refer them to. It's certainly a good way of managing a hidden waiting list. No referral, no waiting list. And it's also appalling that there is no general sign guideline for depression in Scotland only a non-pharmaceutical guideline for therapies that don't exist. So with one in three patients presenting at the GPs for problems relating to stress, anxiety or depression, Scotland doesn't even have a signed guideline for GPs. And like others, I pay tribute to Samich, Penumbra and so many others who help people uh, with mental health. But the SNP always like to compare us to England well, in England, NICE do have recommendations for depression, including mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is a NICE-approved treatment based on sound research since 2004. Are we still waiting for one? MBCD has proven to cut relapse rates in half of those who experience more than two episodes of depression with the strongest evidence base. So John Mason should understand that the reduction in costs for antidepressants would more than pay for this therapy, and the benefit would not only be to the patient, but as Bruce Crawford mentioned, the family, and I welcome the fact that he did mention the family, the patient and the family, would be, the benefit would be far greater than a daily dose of pills. So I then googled the Scottish Medicines Consortium close, depression please. for the equivalent of the NICE guidelines. I found a list of drugs, but no psychological therapies. So we should not be surprised because the guidelines are simply not in place because there's not a commitment from this government. Many thanks. Now call on Rhoda Grant. Up to four minutes, please. And thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, like others in this debate, want to pay tribute to the hard-working staff that do provide services, um, both in hospitals and in our communities, with very limited resources. 
And I think Malcolm Chisholm was right to say that we have to draw attention to the problems of those services or we, we would be remiss in our duty. Over 200 peop young people waiting for more than a year to access mental health services. It's unacceptable. Young people are having their life chances damaged due to a lack of service at this really important time where they need to make decisions. Malcolm Chisholm also quoted um, the Scottish Children's Service Coalition, and they went on to say um, families usually experience months of waiting even before referral to CAMS. The consequent delay in diagnosis and appropriate support can result in crisis and the need for costly extra resources. So actually, this is not a, a cost-saving measure. It actually costs more because people's conditions deteriorate, ne needing more intervention than they would have needed if they had been seen more timely. Specialist services are few and far between, and Jim Hume talked about people from Aberdeen um, going to Dundee. Well, can I say the people from the Highlands and Islands also have to go to Dundee, and that's a huge distance for many to travel, and especially in low-income families where they can't visit so often. This must have a real impact on young people's mental health to be separated for family, from family and friends for so long. Can I reiterate um, Dr Richard Simpson's points when he raised the issue of referral rejections and the need to investigate why these rejections are so high in some area? What is happening to those who have been rejected? What support are they receiving? Indeed, where are they receiving it? And has any uh, cognizance been taken of their outcomes? What's happening to them in the long term? Are they receiving appropriate support when they require it? So I would welcome the comments from the Minister on that. Um, both the Minister and John Mason and indeed a number of people um, talked about the stigma associated with me mental health and how that can impact on providing services within the community. I think it was the Minister that talked about self-stigmatisation um, because people were unwilling to speak out but I, I would kind of put a note of caution in that because it's very difficult to speak out given the stigma, especially when people are at their most vulnerable. I think it would take a very brave person um, in normal circumstances to speak out and share their own experience. When they face a backlash, um, that becomes even more difficult, especially if they are currently um, having mental health illness as well. A number of people um, spoke about physical activity, and I would have to say I really agree with this. I think we need to do an awful lot more into showing how um, physical activity of any kind, gardening, as well as I'm sure marathon running and the like, um, actually helps people's mental health. And I've read of people who have been able to come off uh, medication because they have um, a, an exercise regime that helps them do that. I think those things are recognised, but not often um, given given as a credible option. We need to look at things like prescribing access to leisure centres, sporting facilities and the like to get people more active, rather than maybe looking at drugs if this is proven to help them. A number of people talked about um, self-harm and how that's doubled. Can I just maybe mention a case about uh, a young person spoke to me uh, very recently about um, her own self-harm and the fact that she needed to go to A&E to be stitched. We need to train staff in A&E how to deal with people who self-harm because she was refused anaesthetic while her arm was being stitched because she had done this damage to herself without anaesthetic in the first place. And we need to deal with those issues and make sure people are trained um, to, to help people. Presiding officer, Thank we need to, um, to, to, to hear the review of SNAP and I look forward to the Minister telling us when that will be available and indeed an investigation into re rejected referrals. Thanks very much. I now call on the Minister to wind up. Um, Minister, you have five minutes, please. Not wind up the debate, just make your closing speech. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And can I uh, begin have, by again welcoming the fact we've had this debate? I agree with uh, Mary Scanlon. I think the tone of the debate has, uh, by and large, been very good. I think it's important that we strike that right tone for this uh, subject matter more than uh, most, uh, it has to be said. Uh, Bruce Crawford uh, said that this isn't a debate about statistics, but about the quality of life for individuals, and I very much agree uh, with that perspective. And let me say, uh, uh, that will always be uh, my uh, starting point. D uh, delivering a uh, person-focused uh, health care uh, will be a priority for uh, this uh, government. He did raise the uh, challenges for uh, health boards and his own uh, area of fourth value related to uh, CAMS. I know he had hoped to 
uh, raised that in uh, uh, themed questions early today. Unfortunately, we didn't reach uh, that question. Hopefully, he will be reassured that I have uh, contacted uh, Forth Valley and the uh, other uh, six uh, boards where this uh, has. They've not reached the uh, CAMS referral uh, target. Nanette Milne and Rhoda Grant raised the issue of uh, social uh, prescribing. I absolutely recognise the importance of this. I think this is a very uh, important area. Work is underway through NHS Health Scotland to promote awareness of uh, and access to social uh, prescribing. We'll be happy to report back to Parliament on that uh, later on. John Mason invited me to come and visit uh, the care home in his constituency. Let me say to Mr Mason, I'd be very happy uh, to do so. Uh, the issue, uh, there was an exchange again between Mr Hume and Mr uh, Mason in relation to uh, parity between uh, physical and mental health. I just wanted to touch on this again. And I do make the point I'm happy to discuss this uh, further, but I, I do need to emphasise, because Mr Hume is suggesting that there is some fundamental difference between what we have here in Scotland and England. He mentioned that uh, the National Health Service Scotland Act 1978 sets out that we have a, a, a duty to promote a, a service designed to secure the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of illness. But before that, illness is defined as physical and mental health. So it is already there. I, I, I'm not quite sure what is at contest, but let me say to Mr Hume, I'm happy to discuss the matter uh, further with them very briefly. Mr. Jim Hume. It does say illness, but in the Health and Social Care Act of 2012 from south of the border, it actually specifies mental illness. It states, in the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of physical and mental illness. Jamie, Man, I literally have it in front of me and I can read that, but if you go to the National Health Service of Scotland Act 1978, Although it's not in the same order, if you go to the clause before, uh, it talks about improving uh, uh, the physical and mental health of the people of Scotland. Uh, that, is, uh, that is what illness is uh, defined as. Um, in terms of uh, the issue of uh, prescribing that uh, Mary Scanlon raised, let me, of course, make the point that prescribing is a clinical uh, uh, decision. And I would refer uh, Ms Scanlon and other members to the comments of John Gillis from the Royal College of uh, general practitioners, the, the uh, chair, who said, as the stigma attached to mental health decline, more patients raise uh, problems such as depression with their GPs. There is good evidence that GPs assess and treat depression appropriately, including uh, the prescribing of uh, uh, medicine. Uh, in terms of research funding that Mr Hume uh, raised, it is not the case that there has been a reduction in mental health research funding to NHS boards. There are various uh, sources of funding, and of course, funding will rely on bids uh, coming uh, forward. Malcolm Chisholm, Chisholm quoted uh, the GP who feels under pressure not to refer patients to specialist services. Uh, let me say very clearly, for Chamber, that is not my expectation. If GPs uh, believe they should refer someone uh, onto specialist services, then uh, they should. And I have to say, uh, the figures wouldn't suggest that there is a problem with the number of referrals. CAMS has seen a 60% increase in the number of uh, referrals in the last uh, two. Uh, years. Very briefly, uh, Dr Simpson. The problem is that the percentage numbers have not risen. We are having these rejections and they have gone on for years, despite the fact that the guidance is there. I am yeah. about to touch on uh, rejected referrals because, uh, as Dr Simpson knows, or he should know, his colleague uh, Patricia Ferguson raised this with me in the chamber. Uh, I mean, th there are a number of reasons why a referral may uh, be rejected, such as the referral not meeting the criteria for access to camps. What I would say is where a referral it does not meet the criteria, we would expect the service to signpost the child to uh, the most appropriate service. But let me uh, say I, I recognise the importance of the issue and I will undertake to look at the issue further, particularly in relation to uh, regional variation. I will be happy to report back to uh, Parliament further on that uh, particular uh, 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 issue, President Officer. Uh, there are much, uh, other, many close, other please. areas that were touched on in uh, the debate that I probably don't have time to uh, focus on. Let me just touch on the Sandra uh, Grant review uh, report that was raised by uh, Jim uh, Hume. Let me say that this, uh, there is uh, work uh, underway to uh, assess this uh, further. Good progress is uh, being made and uh, we hope to report back uh, further uh, soon. Let me just close uh, very quickly. Uh, I would welcome the fact we have had this debate. I look forward to returning to the subject matter. I hope we can recognise that progress has been made, just as I recognise uh, further progress still has to be made. Many thanks. I now call on Liam MacArthur to wind up the debate. Mr MacArthur, you have until five o'clock. Thank you very much, Deputy President. It is 12 months on since the Scottish Liberal Democrats last uh, used our debating time to focus 
uh, on mental health. I'm proud of that consistency and indeed the commitment across this chamber uh, to keep mental health issues towards the top of the political agenda. Uh, the debate, as expected, has been uh, very constructive. Um, I thank all those who have participated and empathise with those who didn't maybe have the time to fully develop uh, their arguments. Um, and while I don't support the government's uh, amendment, I welcome the tone that the minister adopted in his opening remarks and acknowledge the progress that has been made. The mental health strategy is good and I welcome the heat target uh, for treatment of those suffering uh, mental ill health. The fact remains, however, as a number of speakers have uh, pointed out, meeting those targets has been patchy and in some cases we appear to be moving in the wrong direction. The effect of this, particularly in relation to child and adolescent mental health services, is a genuine concern. I think a point made by Dr Simpson and Malcolm Chisholm in their comments. As my colleague... I'm going to struggle, I'm afraid, Dr Simpson, sorry. As my colleague Jim Hume highlighted when opening the debate, only half of the health boards are now meeting the new 18-week target for treatment and five are failing to meet the old 26-week target. Meanwhile, the availability of educational psychologists is below what is needed and again, adult psychological services are falling short of targets set. In practice, what this means is that the opportunity to intervene with those who need help, to put in place support, identify coping strategies, whatever it may be, uh, all of this is delayed, potentially with serious consequences. As Sam H. warned, the later individuals engage with health services, the more complex their treatment and recovery uh, will be. But let me be clear, this is not a criticism of those on the front line in our health, care and third sectors. Without the contribution they make, invariably above and beyond uh, anything we have a right to expect, as Jim Hume and indeed the Minister uh, emphasised, the situation for those for, with poor mental health in Scotland would be profoundly worse. It's why Scottish Liberal Democrats prioritised mental health in our recent budget negotiations with, the, with ministers, and also why in 2013 we called for additional support to boost under-resourced psychological therapies. And little wonder these pressures exist given the numbers affected. The range of conditions may be wide, and some people do move in and then out of poor ill health. But this is not a niche. As Nanette Milne pointed out, the latest social attitude survey confirms one in four have a personal experience of mental health through their, ill health through their life. The impact, though, stretches far, far wider. In this and previous debates, members have spoken passionately from direct personal experience, whether themselves, a family member uh, or a close friend. I can think of a few other debates in this chamber where similar insight and empathy can be brought to bear. It is also one, the only one of the reasons I believe we must elevate still further the importance we attach to tackling poor mental health and encouraging good mental health. Scottish Liberal Democrats do believe it is now time for Scotland to follow the lead taken south of the border and to legislate to afford equal treatment to both mental and physical health. Progress has been made here and measures are in place to go further, but this falls short of putting mental health on an equal footing with physical health. And this matters. As the head of the Blyde Trust in Orkney, Fraser Campbell, explained to me recently, too often mental health services are way down the list in terms of budget allocation and other resources, for example, hospital space, room design, etc. That is why Fraser Campbell wants to see equality in service provision. In passing, can I briefly record my gratitude to those who helped raise around £12,500 for the Blyde Trust at Strictly Come Dancing on Friday night, uh, particularly the dozen souls who uh, put at risk life, limb and reputation on the dance floor. As well as the money raised, I hope this event brought the work of the Blyde Trust and the needs of those who suffer poor mental health in, in Orkney to a wider audience. Certainly the issues of stigma and a reluctance to seek help are known to be more prevalent in smaller, particularly rural communities. Whatever other steps we take, I agree with Rod Campbell, we need to be more open and honest about mental health in this country. But, Presiding Officer, if mental health is something people find hard to talk about openly, it is as nothing compared to the taboo surrounding suicide. Obviously not everyone with a mental health issue considers taking their own life, but the numbers who do and who succeed remain high despite a reducing trend in recent years. In 2013, 795 people died by suicide in Scotland. Male suicides run at three times the rate for females, and according to the Samaritans, suicide is now the leading cause of death of under 35s in this country. That last statistic is truly shocking. Those with most of the life ahead of them, those with so much still to experience, with so much still to contribute, reaching a conclusion that they cannot bear to continue living. This is truly appalling and demands recognition of depression for what it really is. Last time I spoke in this debate, I talked about Andy Harrison, a friend, work colleague and flatmate from my days working in Westminster. 
and he took his own life four years ago after a long battle with depression. To this day, I find it hard to understand or accept such a tragic loss of talent, vitality and decency. Andy's wicked sense of humour and generosity of spirit that made him such a privilege to know masked a deep-rooted despair that ultimately killed him. Since then, I've learned of others who found themselves wrestling with many of the same demons as Andy. In my own Orkney constituency, there have been a spate of suicides over the last six months or so. While apparently not out of keeping with the statistical averages, nevertheless, in a community the size and character of Orkney, those deaths have touched people very profoundly. I learned recently of someone I was at school with who took their own life last year. I can still remember the shock at being told. And even though we know that each suicide involves an individual with their own personality, their own circumstances and representing their own tragedy, we are perhaps guilty of seeing the statistic rather than the person. In truth, very often, even those closest don't realise the full extent of the risk until it is too late. Again, this is why we must create the conditions whereby issues of mental health, including depression, can be talked about without fear of stigma and judgment. I firmly believe that one way of helping achieve this is through setting an ambition of zero suicides. To Mr Mason, I, I would say this is not the same as setting a target, nor is it, I believe, inconsistent with the objectives underlying the Assisted Suicide Bill. It is about setting an aspiration, changing the mindset about how those with mental health issues are cared for. Evidence from elsewhere shows that it can have dramatic and positive effects. Mersey Care in Liverpool, for example, is a programme involving improved training for staff um, working with parents and patients and families to develop a personalised safety plan, a dedicated safe from suicide team providing advice, support and monitoring, and close working with partners like Samaritans. In Detroit, which has signed up to such a commitment, the area covered by the programme has reported no suicides in over two years. Again, this is not a criticism of existing schemes such as Choose Life, but a plea to go further, to aspire to something even more ambitious. If we fall short of this ambition, let's at least be closer than we currently are. As I said in closing the debate last year, this is an issue that needs to be discussed openly, taken seriously and addressed effectively. It is not a second-class condition and ultimately there is no good health without good mental health. One year on, this is truer now than ever and I urge colleagues across the chamber to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on mental health. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 12495 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12495. Formally moved. Thank you. James Kelly has indicated that he wishes to speak against the motion. Up to three minutes, Mr Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to, a vote to oppose the Government business motion, and I do so on the basis that the Government have refused a request from the Scottish Labour Party for a statement on the future of Presswick Airport. I am, uh, I am aware and supportive of the importance of Presswick not only to Ayrshire, but to the wider uh, Scottish economy. However, it is the duty of Parliament uh, to hold the Government to account on this issue and its actions on Presswick. The recent Audit Scotland report published last week noted that the costs involved uh, from the public purse had doubled to £40 million from the previously stated figure of £21 million. And Audit Scotland also called for clear and robust plans to be spelt out. And it's against that background that Labour has asked for a parliamentary statement. Given the scale of this issue, it's staggering that the only government-initiated statement to the full parliamentary chamber was on the 8th of October 2013 by the then Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Nicola Sturgeon, to indicate that uh, negotiations were underway to take the, the uh, airport into public ownership. I think it's completely unacceptable that in a year and a half we have not had a government minister come of the government's own accord and make a statement and be accountable to Parliament on this important issue. In light of the Audit Scotland report, there continue to be questions about the ongoing costs involved 
the projected passenger numbers and also the future business plan. And that's why we need a statement. It's simply not good enough for the government to adopt. I can't be bothered to come and speak to his attitude. This government needs to take Parliament seriously. The workforce, the workforce at Presswick deserve answers. The public deserve answers. And Parliament is a platform for those answers. And that is why the Labour Party will continue to call for a statement on the future of Presswick and also oppose the business motion tonight. I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to respond, Minister, up to three minutes. Presiding officer, Mr Kelly confuses money expended with a loan facility and he, I think he probably needs to check a few more of his facts as he moves along. Presiding officer, the Audit Scotland report vindicates the actions taken by the Scottish Government. It shows we made the right decision to safeguard 3,200 jobs and... Yeah, yeah. safeguard 3,200 jobs and secure a vital infrastructure asset that contributes more than £61 million annually to the Scottish economy. If we had not stepped in, Glasgow Presswick Airport would have closed. Presiding officer, if however, presiding officer, if however, the Labour Party Presiding officer, if, however, the Labour Party want to question Mr. the safeguarding... Mr Kelly, the Minister is not taking an intervention. If the Labour Party want to question the safeguarding of 3,200 jobs, their deputy leader had the opportunity to raise that at FMQs last week, and she has a further opportunity tomorrow. Alternatively, if Labour wants a longer discussion, they can use their own time during opposition business next week. Presiding officer... I'm sure the irony of Labour opposing Labour business next week will have not escaped the majority of this chamber. <laughs> that is taking opposition for opposition's sake a bit too far. Presiding officer, I move the motion on behalf of the Bureau. I now put the question to the Chamber. Order. The question is that motion number 12495 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12495 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is as follows. Yes, 70. No, 51. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of five Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions number 12497, 12500, 12502, and 12505 on approval of SSIs on block. Moved on block. And motion number 12506 on the referral to the Parliament of the Local Government Finance Scotland Amendment Order. Moved. Questions on these motions will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 12504 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the approval of a Scottish statutory instrument Section 30 order on the franchise. I would ask members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. I now call on Bruce Crawford to speak on behalf of the Devolution Further Powers Bill Committee. Mr Crawford. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Officer. I'm pleased to be able to make a short contribution as the convener of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. 110,000 additional citizens of Scotland. That is the size of the population of Scotland of the chance to be enfranchised if in the coming months the Scottish Parliament passes the necessary legislation. I hope that Parliament tonight will approve the draft order to transfer powers to the Scottish Parliament and allow that legislation to be brought forward once the Privy Council has given its approval. I am delighted to report that all five political parties represented on my committee unanimously agreed to do just that, recommend we give approval tonight at decision time. 
This will add Parliament's approval to the agreement of both Houses of the UK Parliament, one chamber, albeit a little more reluctantly than the other. <laughs> for me, this, the, but what a prize, President Officer, and for me the prize is another step forward towards creating a modern democracy, building on the historic reforms that delivered votes for the ordinary person, not just the rich and the privileged few, and votes for women, reforms that characterised the previous century. And the work the committee, that my committee has undertaken, we have also felt the palpable desire of Scotland's young people to be involved in decisions that affect their lives. We have been to Fort William and Leavenmouth as part of Parliament Days and spoken to over 200 16 and 17 year olds and furthermore surveyed a further 1,000. The results of this activity can be summarised by simply saying the overwhelming majority want and are ready for this change. One comment from a young man from Fort William sticks in my mind when we discussed voting in the recent referendum. He said, why should an older generation get to decide our future when it's our future you're all voting for? I could not agree more with that. I look forward, President Officer, to the work that comes next to scrutinise the bill that the Scottish Government is set to introduce. We will endeavour, President Officer, to carry out the detailed scrutiny that would be expected of us and allow Parliament the chance to get this legislation on the statute books by the summer recess and ultimately give those 110,000 young people of Scotland the right that every citizen of Scotland expects in a modern democracy, the right to vote. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We support and welcome this order for three reasons. First, it gives effect to part of the Smith Agreement. That agreement, of course, belongs to all the parties which signed it, and all of those parties have supported the devolution of the power conferred by this order. For our part, Scottish Labour is keen to see delivery of the agreement in accordance with the timetable laid out last year, and this early action in this respect more than delivers on that commitment. Second, as Bruce Crawford has said on behalf of the committee, we welcome votes for 16 and 17 year olds. This is Labour policy, not just for the Scottish Parliament and local government, but across the United Kingdom. The referendum last year engaged young voters on both sides of the argument on the basis of votes at 16. When Harold Wilson's government delivered votes at 18 in the 1960s, it became irreversible as soon as it was done, just as every other extension to the franchise had been. That will be true here too, and we want extending the franchise this time to be followed by wider democratic and constitutional reform across the UK, not least abolition of the House of Lords and creation of a Senate of the nations and regions of the United Kingdom. Thirdly, passing this order now will allow work to go forward on implementing votes at 16 in good time for the Scottish Parliament elections next May. Many of those who voted as 16-year-olds last year and all the 17-year-olds will be over 18 by then and a whole new cohort of young voters will have to be added to the electoral register. There is also a job to be done in engaging these new voters and if they are to be as fully informed and engaged as we would want, that job has to start as soon as possible. For those reasons, presiding officer, we welcome this order and we look forward to a bill being brought forward in the next few weeks to extend the franchise accordingly. Annabel Goldie. Presiding officer, this section 30 order is historic. It represents the first legislative change to be brought about following the report of the Smith Commission. It is the forerunner of a major package of powers being brought forward by the UK Government, which will make this Parliament one of the most powerful devolved legislators in the world. In itself, it powerfully refutes the proposition peddled by the Yes campaign in last year's referendum that no new powers would flow to this Parliament in the event of a no vote. That bogus assertion is today laid bare. These new powers, based on cross-party consensus, have indeed begun to flow. The draft provisions for a new Scotland Bill have been published. The UK Government is now focused on final revisions to them and on launching various strands of public engagement. But this legislation is more than a mere taster. Today we have a devolved and developed proposal for a new power that is substantial in itself. This order proposes a very significant change to the franchise in Scotland a very important development for 16 and 17 year olds and it reflects the impressively high levels of interest, engagement and awareness from that age group witnessed during the referendum. 
Presiding officer, in 1928, women were given suffrage on an equal status to men. In 1969, the franchise was lowered from 21 to 18, and today sees a further exciting development. So on this side of the chamber, we welcome this first piece of post-Smith Agreement UK legislation. It is a significant step in the process of delivering to this Parliament the new powers to which all the parties in this chamber have agreed. I support the motion. Tavish Scott. Presiding officer, I thought I misheard uh, Lewis MacDonald. I thought he said he wanted to demolish the House of Lords, which I thought maybe reflected more the building than, uh, than anything else. Uh, we too support the, uh, the, the order in front of Parliament this afternoon for a couple of reasons, not least of which the, uh, in relation to the Smith Agreement and giving effect to the Smith Agreement. And I'm, I want to thank Bruce Crawford for, Crawford for his careful handling of the committee proceedings, although this is maybe a rather easier issue than uh, some that uh, the committee are currently dealing with, and also uh, the Cabinet Secretary for his handling of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Minister ministerial aspects uh, of this. I'm sure the government will wish to also recognise that uh, the Scottish Secretary moved this matter on very quickly indeed to give effect to uh, the overwhelming desire of politics in Scotland for this to come into effect in time for the 2016 Scottish general election. I just wanted to make one other point and that is uh, this is about, uh, as others have said, about uh, young people. Um, uh, two weeks ago I was at a junior high school in my constituency with the two members of the Scottish Youth Parliament who said to me or said to the class who were cro cross-examining us, uh, this was the, one of the campaigns that got them into politics. Sometimes this place is all noise and not enough action. Today, today this is action that really makes a difference to people. Yeah. Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to take part in this short debate and to speak in favour of this order to devolve the power to extend the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds, which will deliver, at least at Scottish Parliament and local government elections, the Scottish Green Party's long standing policy. Many organisations and individuals have campaigned on this issue. The NUS, the TUC, Bernardo's, Unison, and the Scottish Youth Parliament campaigned diligently. They proved, as did all young Scots who took part in the referendum, that they are indeed ready to vote, they're motivated to vote, and they're totally qualified to vote. Presiding officer, enabling our young people to vote takes us a step closer to the kind of Scotland we want to become, an inclusive Scotland that empowers its citizens by fully involving them in the decision-making process. And of course, that's not just about voting, but a vote helps young people ensure that local and national government is listening to what they have to say. During the referendum, we all took part in debates in school and church halls across the land. The questions we received from our youngest voters were wholly relevant to the debate. The interest of our youngest voters was intense and their contribution to the debate broadened it. Their involvement made it more meaningful to more of our citizens. Patrick Harvey's members' debate two weeks ago explored how beginning to vote from the age of 16 can help develop a habit and can help involve people in politics throughout their lives. I look forward to future local and national government elections where 16 and 17-year-olds continue to contribute in the articulate, challenging and thought-provoking way they were able to in the referendum. Thank you. I call on John Swinney to respond, Deputy First Minister, four minutes. Mr. Officer, can I begin, first of all, by thanking uh, members of all political parties for the comments that they have made in this short debate this afternoon, and also thank Mr Crawford and the Devolution of Further Powers Committee for the scrutiny they have given of the order that is now before Parliament for approval. Um, it is beyond exaggeration to say that one of the triumphs of the referendum campaign was the decision taken by this Parliament to attach a priority to enabling 16 and 17 year olds to participate in the referendum last September. Um, it was a measure of the capacity and the capability of the young people of Scotland that they exercised that responsibility in such an effective and a dignified way in every part of the country and seized the opportunity to take part in shaping the future of our country. And the fact that the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government have been able to recognise that and to cooperate to bring forward the order that is before us today is, I think, to pay due respect to the capability and the strength of young people in Scotland who were able to make that contribution in the referendum. And we are now, by our actions today, and by the further scrutiny that will take place when the Government introduces the necessary legislation to Parliament very shortly, 
uh, to ensure that young people, 16 and 17 year olds in Scotland, are able to participate in the Scottish parliamentary elections in 2016 and in the local authority elections in 2017. Of course, we do so today with a great deal more um, agreement in this chamber than we did when the first uh, question of 16 and 17 year olds being able to vote was brought forward. And I'm delighted that the Conservatives have uh, got to a position now where they are supporters of the right of 16 and 17 year olds uh, to vote in the election. And we will, uh, and we will work very hard to persuade the Conservatives of other ways in which they can change their position to come to support the arguments of the Scottish Government in the years to come. Um, Annabel Goldie made um, one of her usually um, uh, creative contributions to the debate with her reflections on the referendum. Can I just say to Annabel Goldie, as one of her fellow members of the Smith Commission, that whilst there are welcome enhancements in the powers of the Scottish Parliament as a result of the Smith Commission, it does not represent the belief of this government that addresses the democratic deficit of our country and we will continue to, to work to secure the further powers that will enable us to deliver the, on the future of our country. And to Lewis MacDonald, can I, can I simply say that the Labour Party would be slightly more credible on the question of House of Lords abolition if they weren't so enthusiastic about trying to get into the institution <laughs> in the first place. And we, and we look forward to the, their decisions in that respect in the years to come. Uh, well, Lewis if, 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 if this is an application, then certainly, Mr MacDonald. Lewis MacDonald. Clear, clearly there are no sinecures which I can offer Mr Swinney or he can offer me, but will he offer me today the support of his party for Labour's proposal for a Senate of the Nations and Regions in place of the House of Lords? Let me, First Minister. let me just say to Mr Macdonald there will be no more enthusiastic supporters of the abolition of the House of Lords than the members of the Scottish National Party. Uh, let me... Let me let me close, uh, President Officer, by also adding to that there will be no more enthusiastic supporters of the abolition of the House of Commons than the Scottish <laughs> National Party into the bargain and the establishment of the full range of independent powers that this Parliament should have. Thank you. That concludes the debate on approval of the Section 30 order on the franchise. We now move to decision time. There are nine questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is at amendment number 12491.2 in the name of Don Swinney, which seeks to amend motion number 12491 in the name of Willie Rennie on privacy and the state be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12491.2 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12491.1 in the name of Richard Simpson, which seeks to amend motion number 12491 in the name of Willie Rennie on privacy and the state be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 12491.1 in the name of Richard Simpson is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12491 in the name of Willie Rennie as amended on privacy and the state be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12491 in the name of Willie Rennie as amended is as follows. Yes, 65. No, 60. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. In relation to the debate on mental health, uh, can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Jamie Hepburn is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Richard Simpson falls. The next question is at amendment number 12492.2 in the name of Jamie Hepburn, which seeks to amend motion number 12492 in the name of Jim Hume on mental health be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12492.2 in the name of Jamie Hepburn is as follows. Yes, 81. No, 42. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendment in the name of Richard Simpson falls. The next question is that motion number 12492 in the name of Jim Hume as amended on mental health be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There is a no. Uh, the motion uh, is not agreed to. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12492 in the name of Jim Hume as amended is as follows. Yes, 120. No, 5. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. I propose to ask a single question on motions number 12497, 12500, 12502 and 12505 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. Nobody objects. So the next question is at motion number 12497, 12500, 12502 and 12505 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSIs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12506. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on the referral of the Local Government Finance Scotland Amendment Order to the Parliament be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12504. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of the Section 30 Order on the Franchise be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Parliament has agreed to approve the transfer of powers to enable legislation. The Parliament has therefore approved the transfer of powers to enable legislation to be brought forward to reduce the minimum voting age in Scotland. That concludes decision time. We now move on to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.